Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. We have Trainer Road in Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Good morning, everybody. We have Hand Up Plus the Black Bibs Racing's Ivy Adrain. Nice. Good morning. Hi. I nailed it. Now you yeah. can change your team name out now. Now that I finally got it, you can change your team name. <laughs> Great. And we also have Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz SRAM, Rafa, lots of different sponsors, Keegan Swenson. What's up, Keegan? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, our current American national champion in cross country mountain biking, as well as uh, short track cross country as well. And Leadville champion. And now you're getting ready to take on the lifetime grand prix. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to it. We're going to get into that later and we'll get into lots of other stuff. Um, but for those that are listening in, we appreciate you. You can subscribe to this podcast, so auto downloads and you don't miss an episode on whatever platform you're using. You can rate the podcast. We would love that. You can share it with people. Also, we would love that. For everybody joining us on YouTube, good to have you. You can join in Thursdays at 8 a.m. Pacific and give this video a thumbs up right now if you're watching on YouTube because that makes it so that other cyclists will also find it. They'll say, hey, this person likes cycling content and they like this video. I'm going to find other people that like cycling content and give it to them right now. And that's how it works. So uh, check that out. Uh, we are going to cover a handful of things today. We're going to talk about consistency and what each of these really high profile athletes do, uh, or high level athletes, I should say, do to maintain consistency or what they've done at different points in their career to maintain consistency when it was challenging. We're going to talk about disciplining races and how to manage expectations. We're also going to talk about peaking too early or perhaps better said, kind of like when you really have a, just you're firing through the base phase and you see a whole lot of improvement, what that means for the rest of your season. We're also going to talk about lots of other things too, uh, but just the same, uh, let's kick this thing off really quick. Keegan, I wanted to do a catch up with you. Cause I think it's been somewhere <clears throat> around five months or so since you've been on the podcast, it's been a while. Well, Maybe that's not right. Um, <laughs> it has been a while. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It has been a while. This is also the first podcast that Amber and Keegan have done together. I know this is exciting. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Celebr celebratory times. Uh, Keegan, I want to talk about your season. You were cross country guy. Now you are a gravel guy. Uh, but you're also a cross country guy still at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what have you changed about your training? Like what's changed going from 90 minute XCO being your main thing as you were working toward a Tokyo qualification as your main goal. Mm -hmm. Now you've got things like unbound that could be 10 to 12 hours for, for you, depending on conditions. Yeah. I mean, as of like, I mean, over the winter, like December, January, February hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, just a bit more volume. And it seems like we backed off the intensity a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, I do do like a fair bit of volume for like a cross country athlete. So I think we're just adding, I mean, adding a couple hours here and there and more six hour rides, a couple seven or eight hour rides. Um, and then I did do like this, a big nine day block as well. Um, just to kind of like do something completely different from what I've done in the past and kind of shock the system a bit. How many so, hours in nine days? Uh, about 41, cool. 42. um, how many, and what were you doing in that time? Like, did you have interval structure or was it all just low yeah, I mean, intensity? Pretty much every day had structure. The only day there was two days, I guess there was two, four days there. We did two shootouts in that block. Um, so that's just so a still local high two intensity. song group ride, which is intensity. <laughs> yeah. And then but no structure, the non-structured days. The other one was like a four hour hard endurance day and plus, so we call it. And then the other one was just, a ended up being seven and a half hour, like just kind of regular endurance day. So otherwise the rest of that block was filled with sweet spot. So, okay. I, it's hold on. <laughs> Ivy and I just both had the same face, just a regular seven and a half hour endurance day is what you said. Is that correct? Yeah. I okay, feel, yeah. I feel so bad. I didn't realize that my face was like mm, for <laughs> uh, people on Spotify or otherwise, I'm just making a very perplexed, uh, kind of grubby <laughs> face. I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm mad because I, did you say 41 hours? Yeah. Four one in night. I don't think I, I was doing math. I don't think I sleep 41 hours in nine days. So I just got mad. <laughs> yeah, it was 30. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing how much, so did you do, what sort of interval work did you do in that week too? Just to, it pretty, I find that it, this is probably interesting to give like an average athlete insight yeah. into what you do when you do a high volume camp. And I hope this goes without saying, but, uh, 
don't try your, this at home, right? That's the saying. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. what he does is what he does. It isn't necessarily what we should do. But with that said, it's still interesting. So, what sort of like inter- were you doing a sweet spot? Were you doing VO two? Were you yeah. doing threshold? Um, so basically, just did sweet spot and threshold. Pretty much every day there was something. Like the shootout was day number one, and then Sunday we did two by twenty LTS with some tempo warm up and some other stuff. And that was. That was honestly like the hardest day for me because I hadn't I haven't done any hadn't done any LT work before this camp so that one kind of was like a little kick in the teeth I was like oh man this is pretty brutal and then it's funny that like a few days later we'd done some but a few sweet spot workouts like two by thirties whatever and then that later that Friday um, the Queen stage as my coach <laughs> called it <laughs> that one was three by twenty LT and wow. I felt better that day than I did on my two by twenties and I think. For me, a lot of it's just like getting used to that, like that feeling of going that hard. Um, I don't know, at a certain point you get fatigued and you just kind of like, you just stay in this hole and it's like, it's kind of fine. You just, you wake up and you do it. And I don't know, it's weird how you can just, just keep going. And then the day after the camp ends, you're, you're just done, you know, <laughs> but even at that shootout, like I still felt pretty decent. Didn't have as much snap in the legs, obviously, as I normally would, but like still, yeah, it was, it was a good something different you know i never done anything like that and like that many days without a rest day and like constant almost every day it was over 200 tss so it was Ooh. like every day it was pretty pretty big and the big days were over 300 so it was like it was a lot you know but it was mm-hmm. like how cool there's something different and uh kind of shocked the system with different style of training and a bunch of sweet spot and we didn't i don't really do like i'll ride a sweet spot here and there but i haven't, I haven't done like a lot of structured sweet spot um I think that was one thing we're going to add in a bit more, especially on the flats. For me, that's like learning how to put down like that big sweet spot power, like going like 30 plus miles an hour on the flats is something that I would always need to work on. And I think it's important for these gravel races, right? So um, yeah, that was, that was the camp. And luckily, Just- uh, <laughs> I think Go Ivy on. and Amber both want to chime in. <laughs> oh, I don't know how many days you had to take off. How many days you had to chill out after that? Um, I took one day off and then took two like recovery ride days and then it was actually going pretty good like the shootout the next weekend was one of my like I felt really good that weekend so I think I'd say it was like maybe four days chilling how and much then, did you uh, eat in those four days <laughs> <laughs> yeah <a lot>. that's... <laughs> it was like it didn't stop you know like after the camp because the whole camp I was trying to eat as much as I could to stay on top of it and then it was just like fire just kept burning for a few days and then finally feel like I got caught up, but yeah. yeah. I just wanted to jump in and share with listeners who might not be familiar. The shootout is a really well-known group ride. It's a very fast kind of race simulation group ride. So when we're mentioning shootout, that's what we're referring to. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty, pretty special. I think it's one of the coolest group rides. I mean, I'd argue in the world we have in here in Tucson, I mean, it's like a nice gentle, like between one and like 3% climb with a couple little bumps. And it's like a 40 minute segment. The road is pretty straight, no stoplights, no stop signs, um, very little traffic, very little traffic. And it's just full gas. <laughs> That's cool. And then after that, like a cat one pro race every weekend. Yeah. You have like Ben Hoffman, Sam Wong, like these like really good, like old, like long distance traffic. Mm-hmm. And then you'll have, you know, even like ITU athletes on the tri side will show up and do it. And then you have every type of cyclist you could imagine as well mixed yeah, in. Yeah. It's just and really like, cool. Last weekend we had like the Project Echelon team was in town doing a camp. So those guys, like their whole squad was there. We had the Fort Lewis cycling team there. Like there was, it's just cool to have like the variety. There's XCO athletes, like everyone. So it's a lot yeah. of fun. And then it's cool because you ride hard. And then after that, everyone like has a truce at a certain point on the course. And everyone mm-hmm. kind of regroups and you chill and like ride at a slower pace, <clears throat> forgive me. And then after that, you kind of loop back around to the same road you were on just going the other way. And then the gas is back on again at the end. Uh, mm-hmm. And there's even like options or people like add on to it. It's really cool. So um, a- another thing I want to say, so you mentioned that you don't do a whole lot of structured sweet spot, but you spend a lot of time riding in what you call end plus, which is like just above endurance. So you're in tempo zone, right? Mm-hmm. Which uh, many people say is the gray zone and you're wasting your time Keegan. So I don't know why you ride there, but, um, just, (laughs) but just the same, you spend a lot of time riding close to sweet spot and around there. 
but you don't necessarily do a lot of, you hadn't done a whole lot of structured work there before. Is that like an accurate yeah, assessment? Yeah, and I do, it's funny, I do do a lot of, but times I've done the most sweet spot is kind of like opening openers for races. Like, let's say like I'm kind of tapering for a race. I'll have like, like a few easy days early in the week. And then like the Friday before I'll do like three by 10 sweet spot as an opener with like some one minute VO two efforts as well. And for me, like that sweet spot's a good zone to kind of get, get everything opened up without like causing too much fatigue in the legs. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Then those N plus rides, like I'll ride, make a kind of a hard endurance pace on the flats. And then if I feel like going harder up the climbs, I'll ride like tempo, maybe tapping like bump off sweet spot a little bit here and there. Um, yeah. So it's like, I'm in that zone a bit, but I'm not always like, we're not always doing structure in it. If that makes sense. Yeah. For Which sure. I think, I think it's like a pretty important zone, especially for like marathon mountain bike and gravel racing. Like I bet you spend 80% of the race in that zone and then there's really hard like five to ten minute sections or there might be like a 20 minute 30 minute climb that's your riding threshold up but otherwise you're riding in that like i guess it'd be i don't know like 70 percent of threshold or so right like you're just in that zone where it's like not quite tempo but it's like hard endurance and you're just kind of like floating in and out of it so i think getting used to riding in that zone is pretty important and then after a while it just becomes like it just becomes easy it just becomes a endurance to a certain point like that we had that one that one four hour hard endurance ride over that nine day block and ross and i are both like oh man we get a recovery day this is sweet you just have to go ride mm -hmm. 270 <laughs> watts for four hours like it's like, <laughs> like your brain just gets used to it and you're like oh this is easy now we just can cruise you know so i think when you get used to it it's it just becomes normal which i think is good <laughs> yeah sweet spot is surprisingly race specific to people that haven't taken like an analytical eye toward their racing, even in something mm -hmm. like cross country, even in something like, uh, well, crit racing, perhaps not as much, but like cross country racing in particular, it's like sweet spot racing. But the difference is where you do your structured sweet spot work, this will have in between, instead of rest in between, you'll have constant interruptions of spikes, but then you'll be sitting in. And I say mm -hmm. that in air quotes at, at that sweet spot effort it certainly doesn't feel like you're sitting in. Right. So, uh, um, you did that. You also went out and did the, you did a spirit quest as well. Is that fair to say? The to find the spirit hunt. of gravel? Yeah. Spirit yeah. hunt. <laughs> okay. We Not a quest, it. a hunt. <laughs> yeah, we found it. <laughs> and if it's hunting, did you uh, yeah. also, did you dispatch the spirit of gravel as well? Is that the, was that the point? I think we've, we've made friends with the spirit of gravel now. <laughs> I think we found the yeah. true spirit. So. Okay. What was this? Um, what was this yeah. camp that you did? <laughs> no, yeah, this was something, um, Russell and I, uh, last year we like cooked up this idea to go do like a see three or four day camp in Southern Arizona. And last year was actually just going to be on road bikes. Like we're going to ride down through Patagonia and Bisbee and like all these other little towns down there. And then some nasty weather came in and it rained and we we're like, ah, oh, we're just not, I'm not going to bother with that right now. So then, uh, <laughs> we got, then we started racing and all of a sudden we left Tucson and we never ended up doing it. So this year we're like, oh, we should do might try and do that again, but make it a gravel camp. Cause I kind of feel like when I race a gravel bike, it feels like almost foreign to me. Like it's something that I haven't spent a lot of time on. I'm not like, I can go fast on it, but I'm not really comfortable with like, like the position's a little different, the sending's different. Like you have all these small intricacies that like, you're not quite used to the tire pressure. Like you just don't, you, it's just, I'm not familiar with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that was our idea. Like, Oh, let's just spend, we'll do four days and do like see if we can do like six hours every day and just get used to the bikes and have some fun and go see some cool stuff. So Russell mapped out this route ended up being about, I think it's about 400 miles over some very rugged drought gravel. And I knew <laughs> like <laughs> Russell's like, ah, oh, like road shoes will be fine. Yeah. 38, 40 seat tires. It'll be fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, there was some baby heads and some chunk and like, it was cool. There were some days where it was, it was like, Oh, this is pretty, pretty slow moving. Then there's also mm -hmm. some really fast, smooth, cool gravel. Um, Maybe has a rock kinda, you, hill, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We should clarify. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Throwing a lot of, out a lot of glossary terms here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with, with that, what did you learn from that camp? Yeah. I mean, I guess we kind of learned, um, I mean, for the big thing, like we learned, like, I guess, you just get used to sitting on the bike so long you get beat up and like, you're just out there, you know, like the biggest day was we were, it was like seven and a half hours, but you're carrying all your stuff. Like 
we weren't camping. We were in Airbnbs and hotels. So it was pretty light, like just a, a saddle bag and bar bag and stuff. So it was pretty minimal, but still adds an extra, like, I don't know, probably 25 pounds, especially when you have all the water. And we were also like trying to figure out like kind of nutrition and hydration, like kind of what we can get away with. I think some of these races, you have to push the limits of like what, like maybe you're not getting optimal amount of water or whatever, but maybe it's faster. And like, I'm not like mm -hmm. standing up t telling people to train dehydrated, but I think there is like a time and place, <laughs> like experiment with that stuff and like push the limits of what you think you actually need and what you can get away with. Um, and we also rode pretty hard. I mean, every day we were trying to ride, you know, I think we rode like between 230 and 250 Watts with like some hard efforts of climbs just because we're like, Oh, we're six hours in let's race up this climb to see what it feels like to go that hard seven hours and to a, to a hard ride, you know? Um, so yeah, that was, it was cool. It was a good way to get in a big solid training block and get comfortable on the bikes and, um, kind of see some cool terrain. So I think you can mix fun with adventure and training all at the same time. If you do it right. Look at this, cool. all these cross country mountain bikers that used to just like run in little circles and now they're doing big things like a yeah, big like adventurous routes released from our cage, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's like, it's cool. Cause it's training. Like, I mean, we did 24 <laughs> hours and four days of riding, you know, which is like yeah. a pretty big block. Um, and with cross country Olympic, you have to be much more like structured and specific about a lot of what you do. Whereas with gravel it is a whole lot more of it is building endurance and everything else like you're doing. So yeah, mm -hmm. it makes sense. especially when you're talking about performing at the front end, because you're not showing up to a single one of those races, not to win it, you know? So right. that's like a, a slightly different approach than if you're just going to finish it. Right. Um, yeah. and even and get I, like a good personal time. It's very different than what you do to, to win it and to beat everybody else. So yeah. And there's a lot of small intricacies that go into these like long, like eight, 10 hour races, like sure you can get away with training for five to six hours, but I think there's a lot you can learn about like maybe your bike setup's not right. And your hands start to hurt after eight hours and you need to like change this and that. So I think that's where like us being like from coming from XCO where it's all short and you have like, see, like you're not ever like sure your position might not be like the most comfortable, but it's fast and you like it and it descends, it descends well, it climbs well, it's fine. But for these longer races, I think you need to like spend time in that position and make sure the bike's good. And we're like, I'm like, man, I rode all this gnarly stuff on 38 C tires. Like maybe I don't need to ride. I don't need to follow the norm and do what everyone else is doing. Like I can get away with smaller tires and mm. like there's other, there's so many things like I didn't realize like that was fine. I did the whole trip on 40 C bars. Like I've been playing with different setups and like it works fine for me. So I think there's like things you learn that, mm. that work. So, Yeah. That's swapping out those weekend rides, right, Amber? Um, mm -hmm. Whatever your scheduled weekend ride is, you can swap it out for a longer endurance one with Trainer Road. That's a good way to do it. So you can get yeah. that, that prep um, for sure. Okay, last thing to check in with you on. This weekend, so tomorrow, I'm flying out bright and early down to Tucson. Uh, and <clears throat> you are also going there for 24 hours in the old Pueblo, which we've done as a podcast team before. That was, uh, that was a, just an absolute gong show over there. That was like, it was, <laughs> it was terrible. We had people getting hurt and it was bad. Um, people just deciding like, I don't really want to ride at night. And then some of us just doing back to back to back laps at night, trying to make up for it. It was miserable. So this year, uh, I'm doing it again and I'm doing it with a totally different team. My brother, I've never done a bike race with my brother. In fact, I don't know if my brother has done a bike race. Maybe he's done a couple, but he really wants to do this one. So I'm super excited. So I'm on a team with my brother, uh, his boss, which will be fun. Uh, his boss is coming too. And then, uh, I guess if you're going to take time off, why not bring your boss? And then, uh, the other thing too, we have like a handful of friends that are going to do this. Ryan Standish, another train road employee, also known as Jorts guy, uh, on the <laughs> internet, he's going to be on the team. Sophia's on our team. Uh, it's going to be a fun group. Uh, Sean Estes, good friend of mine. So, uh, we're going to all be in a team, but you are doing it solo and you're not just doing it solo because you want to go rack up a lot of time or because you don't get along well with others. You want to go because you actually want to like set a record. Is that, is that the case? Like, do you want to go for the record? Yeah. I mean, I'm not doing it. Like I'm doing it for fun, but like, I also, <laughs> air quotes. <laughs> I don't like, if I'm going to go do something like this, I want to try and get the record, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I kind of know what I'm getting myself into, but I also 
I also realized I really have no idea what I'm doing, which is kind of cool. <laughs> like, I think I'm as well prepared as I can be. Like I have like, an awesome support crew. Like I have, you know, Myron, team manager, Jordan, Tobin's out here to help. Um, Josh Tostados can help me in the pits. He was actually going to race, but sadly he broke his hand a couple of weeks ago. So he's out. Mm-hmm. He is one of the solo animals. He's done it a ton of times. He's won it before and he's, you know, just a ultra marathon beast. So I think it'd be cool to have him helping me. So I think, I've got enough people in my corner that I think it'll, I'll make it through. <laughs> but I was thinking about it last night. I was like, man, it's going to be a long, it's a long bike ride. I mean, that's <laughs> like, a lot. Can, let's know. put that in context. So what's the record right now? Is it 20 laps? It's 20 laps. Yeah. So you'd have to do 21 laps. Each lap takes about an hour. Uh, well, for, for you, probably. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe a bit longer than that. Trying I, to my, do, if I do like hour 10, like I think. That's, that's kind of my goal. Yeah. Hour 10 hour 15 consistent. What did I say? To you? I think it was two eighty six NP for me was an hour and two minutes, I think. Yeah. So, and then that AP on that was like two fifty four. Um, so it's pretty constant for a mountain bike course, but there's still time to surge and everything else. Mm-hmm. So, and I think it's what it's, uh, in that case, somewhere around like 16 or 18 miles, I think, or 17 think miles. 16 miles. Yeah, 17 miles a lot. So, so if you do, geez, that, I'm going to do math really quick. 366 miles, I think. <laughs> That's a lot Ouch. in a day. <laughs> yeah. That is a lot. That's a ton. Yeah. yeah. That and I'm trying, my goal is to try and break a thousand TSS. If I can do like a 1100 or 1200, <laughs> that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be pretty cool, he says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, okay. Do you, uh, should we just wait? Because I also know that Monster, one of your sponsors, is going to be documenting this. So I don't want to like give away any, you know, unique approach things that you're working on. I mean, there's nothing really, really unique. I mean, I think they're gonna capture some some interesting stuff out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's gonna be pretty crazy. I mean, I've ran it through a pretty I think I have a pretty solid nutrition plan. Uh, my nutritionist and I had a good chat and up with a good plan like not plan to hit any caffeine until after midnight like everything's just such a different approach than a normal bike race like you're thinking like you just gotta play the long game you know not get caught up in going too hard too early and like really focus on eating like somewhat of a solid solid meals every i'm planning to eat something decent every like i don't know about every four hours and in between there you know kind of run off like junk food more or less Mm -hmm. you know like simple things little like white bread sandwiches and stuff like that. Um, some Oreos and, you know, trying to avoid gels and like too much race food. Cause I think that's just going to like really mess with my stomach after that long, maybe save yeah. those for like when I'm just sick of eating and don't want to chew on anything anymore or mess with anything, I can start moving to gels then. Um, but yeah, and I have, you know, multiple, like I have two blurs set up, so they're both going to be identical, both blur TRs. So those are, that's your mountain bike full suspension. Yeah. And yeah, you're running 120 mil of travel on it. Yeah, which I think sounds like it's pretty overkill for this course. But uh, like a lot of people race hardtails. But I think when you're out there that long, like I think being comfortable is the most important part. Mm. So um, I have two of those. And I run a rigid post in both. So I figure I don't need the dropper really anywhere from looking at the course. Like there's only one little steep bit. And also droppers, like you kind of squat to use them, right? Like your legs, you think you take more load when you're trying to use them. And I want to be as like efficient as possible. So I'm either going to be standing up high if my legs locked out or I'm going to be sitting on the post. <laughs> so yeah. I think kind of save a little bit of weight that way. And that'll help, you know, make up for the 120, which will be nice as softer. I'll run 2.4 aspens. Probably have like I decided to run a 38 tooth chain ring, but I might swap that back if I get it feels like it's too much, but it sounds like it'll be fine. It's pretty relatively flat, and then I can it'll be fine stay in the middle you. of the cassette. Um so yeah, that's Not kind of me. the plan. <laughs> <laughs> have enough lights set up i'll just have lights on both bikes and rotate through all night um yeah I don't know what about <laughs> taking breaks do you plan to take any breaks or do you just plan to kind no, of just roll through I, and I mean, the only breaks like i'll stop to like put on leg warmers and arm warmers and like vests and stuff when it gets cold probably in the evening um and maybe like then i'll stop and like you know, woof down like a little snack real quick, but I yeah. plan to not stop. If I could not stop for more than like five minutes at a time, I think that'd be good. I think once you stop for longer than that, you're going to want to actually stop. And I think for me, if I, like, I just, I can't, like, don't want to, I don't want to sit down ever, you know, you just got to keep like 
keep rolling. Um, yeah. I, 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 it's kind of a hard course to eat on because there's cactus. Everything is pokey. Every single thing that you yeah. see is pokey and the course isn't technical, but it's constantly meandering left and right. And then mm -hmm. add on fatigue to that or poor visibility because the sun goes directly in your eyes uh, when it's setting. And then when it's rising the same thing, and it's like a simple thing that when you're going to grab something out of a pocket to eat it, then it's like suddenly you're one handed blinded by the sun and the course is weaving and you're going to hit cactus. So it's like, yeah, it's the trail itself is not technical, but the consequences are high. Like if you go off, you know, because if you get a bunch of briars stuck into you or something like that, then you're going to be, that's going to take a lot of time to get those out. Right. So yeah. To bring the hair comb uh, and pull them out. Yeah, exactly. Use the hair comb. Uh, Ivy, you want to do this race too, right? Yeah. Maybe I'll do it on cross bike next year. Hopefully. Yeah. It's cross bike worthy. Like you could absolutely ride a cross bike on it. Yeah, not alone, I though. think. Never. No, no, yeah, not so long. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as fun. It'd be way more fun on a mountain bike for sure. But, um, cool. Well, Keegan, good luck to you. If anybody is at 24 Thanks. hours in the old Pueblo, um, I'm sure you'll be able to find Keegan, uh, come find, uh, come find me. I, I, you know, I, it isn't a work trip or anything. So it's not like we're going to have some sort of big tent or something, but we'll be somewhere in, in 24 hour town. Come find us. Uh, yeah, BGCS we'll on the course. Look for, you know, I'll have my be out there all night. So just <laughs> yeah, that's literally where to find Keegan the whole time. So be on course. Uh, good stuff. Um, a quick, uh, quick thing before we get into Eric's question. One thing that I want to mention to people is a lot of people have been uh, talking about better weather training outside, doing all that stuff. And, and an awesome reminder that you can do your entire trainer road plan outside with outside workouts. So like, think of it this way. You could sign up for trainer road. You can get adaptive training. You could get all these benefits and everything else. And you never have to train inside. So many times trainer road is always thought in the context of like, oh, it's just an indoor training tool. Well, it's, it's whatever you need. It can be indoor. It can be outdoor. It can be everything else. So you can get all that benefit. And we're working on what we call workout levels V2, but uh, we're working on a totally new system. It's going to be fantastic. It's been in the works since we, before we launched adaptive training, um, and it's going to take into account and, and really analyze all of your outside workouts at a really high level. It's unprecedented. It's super cool. So we're working on that. It's a high company priority. that will make it even better for when you ride outside. Anyways, all that said, train inside, outside, go to trainerroad.com. Let's get into Derek's question. He says, Hey, podcast friends, I'm a huge trainer road fan. And after discovering the podcast last summer and starting with adaptive training in the fall, it made me so much faster in every way. And that's been backed up by power PRs and KOMs across all durations. Good to hear Eric way to go. Love smashing comms and PRs. Uh, he says, having gotten so much faster than I have ever been previously, I was looking forward to the first race of the year, which is a mass start hill climb race. And he says, uh, is this a time trial? We call it a time trial, but I guess it isn't a time trial when I think about it. Yeah. I mm -hmm. I've seen that before too. And it's like a mass start race. And if it's mass start, it's not a time trial. So, mm -hmm. Uh, would you agree, Amber? <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. He says, now comes the sad part. I finished fourth in the cat three category but expected to be first. I finished in the top 10 last year. And while I was faster by just over a minute this year on an 18 minute climb, my power PRs and times on segments suggest I should have been at least two minutes better, which would have put me in first place. Have any of you experienced this before? Why aren't my gains transferring to a race scenario? Good question, Amber. What's, I mean, you've been through a whole lot of seasons where you've been like early season prep and then showing up for those first races of the season. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into managing expectations, uh, for the first race of the year. And I want to get into that more generally in a second, but first thing I want to say here is mass start versus time trial is a really, really big differentiator. And so what's happening with the people around you in a mass start race is going to have a huge impact on what you actually do, even if you're not necessarily conscious of it at, at, at the time. So there's going to be a lot of variability between what happened last year and what happened this year. Not the least of which is what your competitors have been doing. And the last couple of years, we haven't had a lot of race opportunities. So I think a lot of people have been putting <laughs> some big miles into their training. So you probably aren't the only one coming back with huge gains. Um, and that's one of the things that we see with racing. And I see Ivy's got some good thoughts on here too, that I a hundred percent agree with. So I want to turn it over to her for some comments too. Cool. Yeah, I call this uh, race math or results math, and, and it, <laughs> race <laughs> math is not good math. <laughs> no, it's not. No. It, it's, it can be so self-destructive, uh, especially in 
individual events when stuff can change so much on the day um, for -hmm. like a time trial setting when you have some sort of target in mind. Um, even if you've been on the road or the course a hundred times, stuff can be different that day. Your equipment can be different temperature, wind, like whatever. Um, and so kind of pinholing yourself into what you expect can sometimes limit you too. Um, Mm. and then when it doesn't go to plan and you're seeing like having to reconcile with in the moment that it's not going to plan based upon your race math, um, you have to like reconcile with it in that moment and think about that during a race instead of just racing and focusing on your effort. And there are some major pitfalls with that. That's when you can start spiraling too, right? Where you suddenly are like, uh, actually we've mentioned this before Keegan with cross country Olympic racing with you where like, it's like, shoot, I'm not where I thought I was going to be. And then like, it's really easy to fall into this cycle. Then just be like, like, what's your problem? Why aren't you there? What's your problem? Why aren't you there? Like, why are you sucking? And then that doesn't really help. Like, like it just makes it worse. Right. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's definitely kind of tricky to find that balance of like, so just put your pressure on yourself to perform. And you also like, I know I'm fitter than I was, but like, sorry, sometimes you have to put the race aside and focus. I mean, it's a little different than a hill climb time trial, but for a cross country race, sometimes you have to focus on yourself and less about the race and treat it as more of like a time trial. That makes sense. And just do your thing. And the result is going to be what it's going to be. Um, it's just different than when you're racing, when you're racing the front, if you're racing for a certain position, like there's just like, there's so many variables there. I think go back to your hill climb TT here. Um, it's hard. Like you want to go and set the fastest time on the course, then you obviously have to go out and ride the, your limit for that segment. Right. And that might not be the best way to win the race because someone can just sit on your wheel. And even though it's a hill climb, they're still getting a small draft and then they can come around you to finish. Like, I think for racing, you want to win the race with the least amount of work possible. So if you can win the race and have a lower power, lower power numbers, lower watt per kg than everyone else in the race, then you really won the race and you've done the best job possible. Cause that means you want it easily. <laughs> um, so you, you would sit in, let's uh, everyone else do the work. And maybe that maybe your segment times are slower and maybe the hill climb was slower than before, but you won the race. So I think it's yeah. hard to really like look at this segment and be like, Oh, I'm not as fit as I was, even though I should be like, it's really hard to, you just can't, you just can't let that get in your head. I mean, there's definitely been races where like, Oh, I should have been faster. Like I'm so much fitter this year, but you still won or I still won the race because it's different conditions. There's wind. There's like, you don't know how everyone else wants to race it. So, I mean, it's really like a hard thing to, to balance. Like if you want to go out and do it fast and just attack from the bottom and you're going to risk someone sitting on and nipping you at the finish, but maybe you're going to set a better power PR and a better, like a better segment time. So it's, you got to find what you want out of it, I guess. Yeah. There's different measures of success, right? Ivy. Right. Yeah. And, um, Eric obviously knows their own strengths very well based upon mm-hmm. their their race math and down to the minute of <laughs> they should have done. Um and so they should try to capitalize on some of those strengths. Like I feel like they must know um broken down by by time what their strengths are. Um like for the next next mass start rate race do what Keegan suggested and try to sit in and chill out. And you know that you maybe have a really good like 1K really strong move and try to work that in or something like that. Um, and that might look like on race day, your effort might not be as fast as your PR, you know, Mm -hmm. doing all this race math to, to see how fast you could go on race day. If it's mass start, you probably won't go as fast as you absolutely possibly could if you're playing your cards, right. Right. Or if it's a steep enough climb and you want to just go out and show everyone how strong you are, then you attack right from the beginning and hopefully you can stay out and win. Like there's, you know, <laughs> not advisable. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the course, right? It really depends yeah. on the course. If it's like steep enough yeah. and you're like, I can walk all over these guys. I'm just going to attack from the bottom. And if they can hang, they can hang. If not, that's a bummer. <laughs> so I think there's like so many ways you can go about it. But if there's, if there's a lot, if there's drafting involved, if it's like, I'd say if it's like under like 8%, or you know six to eight percent then there's going to be drafting if it's over like eight or ten there's probably you're probably going slow enough that drafting is really irrelevant and it's more just a motivation of staring at someone's wheel than anything Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so because even and even then yeah oh sorry go ahead i was gonna say like even if you're not drafting you're still staring at the wheel and it helps a lot to like you're like i'm not just not going to come off you know that's one thing i've learned like in the shootout like alexi ramilan and i were having a good race up the madera climb 
and I would attack and he would counterattack. And even though you're not getting a draft, you're just staring at the hub, like, don't come off, don't come off. He's going to slow down. Eventually it's going to get easier. So I think like there's a more, there's more to that than you might think there is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not just about the drafting. When there are other people around you pushing the pace, it's going to affect your pacing because you're going to be influenced by what other people around you are doing. And it's really hard not to be when it's a mass start event. In an individual time trial, it really is just you and you can be very internally mm-hmm. focused and pace according to what you want to do. But in a mass start event, even when there's no drafting, there is going to be an influence of the other writers on you. So that's a really important factor yeah. that's hard to account for with math. <laughs> yeah, even if they're even if they're behind you, and you have, so you have like a 20 second gap, that motivation to stay ahead of them is still going to yes. be greater than when you're on your own. It's like, you see the pack back there, oh, I'm going to go harder so they don't catch me. So like, there's still, there's that kind of motivation too. Mm-hmm. Big time. And after, yeah. after this, after these like disappointing races, um, maybe Amber, you can share a bit on this, but like, you can either look at it as like, man, I failed. And then you can question all of your training, which I think for a lot of us endurance athletes is our initial natural reaction. It's like the unbridled mm-hmm. reaction where we're like, well, because of one single effort, I am going to completely invalidate the months of work that I did prior to this. I'm just going to throw them out. They, they were wrong and they don't matter and everything is wrong and I need to change everything. Or you right. can look at it from a different perspective. Amber, how would you, like, if you were, if you were coaching an athlete, through a situation like this, what are the things that you would encourage them to do when they look back and reflect on that disappointing race? Well, I would want them to not do what I usually do. (laughs) (laughs) You get a really awesome, you know, off season of training. You've been building up to your race season. You feel awesome. You're flying. Like you said, you've got PRs, you know, you're crushing it and you just can't wait to get into a race and show what you can do. And then it doesn't go to plan. So then I would go back to my coach and say, okay, so I really need to work on my climbing, but we also need to get my sprinting up to par and I really need to get my steady state going. And basically like, I need to work on all of the things. Repeatability is low. (laughs) Repeatability. Like I need to do all the things. And it's, it's hard not to get excited when you know, you have good fitness and to put all of those hopes into the very first race. But you have to remember it's that long-term vision, this, your season, isn't all about one race and one race or one day is not going to determine the quality or the success that you're going to see in a season. You have to remember that you're in this for the long haul. It wasn't like you were tapering up for this one perfect day. Right. Um, so what I suggest again is look at this through the lens of curiosity. You're going to learn a lot about the competitors that you'll be going up against for the rest of the season. So this is an awesome opportunity to say, Hey, who's coming out of the off season flying this year, who may have put in a lot of work next year from last year that I need to look at this season. So you start to see who you need to be keying off from maybe in some future races coming down the pipe. Um, but really it, it's, it's about approaching that first race with a sense of curiosity framed in the, like the, framed in that knowledge that you are facing an entire season. And a lot can change over a couple of weeks, a lot, definitely a lot can change over a few months. So, you know, settle in for the long haul and just see how much you can learn from each race. What, what were you able to learn from this race? Maybe one of those things is that race math doesn't always (laughs) (laughs) add up the way that we would like it to. Um, but yeah, managing expectations is, is a lot easier when you approach it from the perspective of curiosity. What can I learn about myself as an athlete and what can I in the future. I typically would try to find in the beginning of every season, like races that I did not care about, like Mm -hmm. C races, B races, whatever it might be, but like fill it in with races or group rides that are like hard group rides that are kind of like race simulation ones. We were talking about the Tucson shootout earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, if you fill, if you have opportunities like that, where you uh, approach it with curiosity and zero expectation, it makes it really easy to, to learn from those events and learn from those because we all get rusty. We forget how, mm-hmm. and then also like with new fitness comes new ways to execute too. That's something that we probably don't talk yeah. about a whole lot, but if suddenly you're really good at steady state power, um, but your, you know, repeatability has dropped off. That doesn't mean that you're a worse athlete. It just means that you have to execute differently and you might be really successful uh, if you can find the right way to use those tools that you've built. So it's, it's more about like, you, you have to give yourself time to figure it out every year. That's normal. 
And mm-hmm. you have to give yourself time to figure out how to deal with all of these new things that you've built. That's normal. So it's, it's really advisable, I think, to fill the beginning part of the season. We've talked about racing in the base phase and everything else of races with zero expectations, just like showing up and being like, how's it going to go? And that once again, it could just be group rides too, but that, that I feel like, because then you go every week, you add another learning every week. It's just one more, one more, one more. And then you really know how to use your fitness and how to race. Well, it's pretty cool. I think it's a a great approach. You can also, as kind of piggyback of what you just said, like you race, you learn to race differently with the fitness you have. Cause I know like, for example, like early season, I don't have a very good reputability and I don't have very good like snap, but I can ride at a really high, like high sweet spot or high threshold pace for a long time. So you can change your tactics of how, how you're going to, how, how that race is going to play out. Like I would never, like I'd never do a cross country race this time of year and like wait for the sprint, right? Like I'm going to try and make it hard from the beginning. And like, this is the pace I'm going to ride. And because I know I can do this and hopefully this is hard for everyone else because I don't want to, want, I don't want it to come down to the last two climbs. Cause maybe I'm not, I'm not prepared for that kind of effort. So you can also like race, to your strengths currently and maybe later in the year like oh i know i can i know i can win a sprint so i'm fine waiting for the sprint but you have to be like wary of what where your fitness is at and what your strengths are in that for this that blocker month or whatever it may be and you can change it so kind of a fun way to go about that with group rides in particular or races it could be but group rides are a fantastic opportunity to do this when they're fast and there's faster people than us which basically every group ride unless you're i don't know Maybe Amber, Ivy, and Keegan have situations where they show up and they are the fastest, but I never have that. So, but in those situations, when you're there, it's like, um, I've done this with our local drop ride, which is like the Tucson shooter, but with Reno, I basically like week one, I will, if I want to work on repeatability, I will count how many attacks I can do. Right. And if somebody doesn't counterattack me, I'll attack myself. So like, if I, <laughs> if I ease up and nobody attacked, I'll be like, okay now attack number three, now attack number four. And then next week I'll say, I made it 15 attacks. Whereas the week before I only made it 10, like, Hey, that's progress. And like little, you kind of like want to push the limits Mm -hmm. with those, with these low consequence races or race sim group rides. You want to push. That's a good way to push the limits to be like, if I attack again, I'm going to absolutely explode, but let's just try it and let's see what happens. And you just keep trying approaching it with curiosity. Like Amber says, because then at that point, that's when you can actually stretch your limits. Whereas mm-hmm. you show up to a race like this and Eric, I'm, I'm not criticizing your approach. Hopefully you can learn from this. You show up to a race and you're like, okay, I've done the race math. Like Ivy said, I know that I can do this and I can do this. So you set very clear bounds for you to operate within, which totally makes sense. when you're talking like a race territory, like there's still, you need to leave room for curiosity on those days too. But at a beginning first race of the season, I personally think that that's not the approach to go. You shouldn't be finding limits for yourself. You should just be going into it and just being like, let's see how it all unfolds. So give yourself opportunities to be able to like explore uncharted, very uncomfortable territory. And that's how you'll end up getting more out of yourself. So any other advice for Eric? That's a good question, Eric. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Job on getting faster, Eric. Yeah. yeah way to seriously. go, man. Let's not lose gonna- that part. <laughs> Yeah. And and here's the cool part is that with all the improvement that you've made moving forward, if you can find other race opportunities for this, you're going to have a banner year. Like it's going to be the best year you've had. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Chris says longtime listener, recent convert watcher. That must mean that you're on YouTube uh, with us, Chris, if you're here, good to see you. Uh, First time caller. He says, thanks for all that you do. I've come to the end of yet another very consistent and fruitful base season with great improvements to show for it, but I'm lacking motivation. I've always pursued the same racing goals every year with my local mountain bike series serving as C and B races and our XC state championship serving as my A race. But this year, I'm just not motivated to do those events. Don't get me wrong. I'm still willing to do the work, but I feel like I need a fresh start in terms of racing. I'm a mid pack finisher, so I'm not motivated by a win as it is out of reach for me. So I guess I'm just a bit bored with just finishing mid pack at the same races every year. What have you done in similar situations? I hope answering this question can be valuable to other listeners because I feel like I can't be alone in this. Yeah, for sure. Um, not being alone in this, you're not at all, Chris, uh, that happens with plenty of athletes. Uh, Keegan, you're taking on like these big, long ultra endurance events. It's a totally different thing for you, even though you've done long things before, but it's a very different focus. Amber, 
heck you went from swimming to cycling, but then also within cycling, you changed your focus multiple times. And Ivy you've done a, genuinely, I think every, have you done a downhill race? I don't know if you've, maybe that's no. the only thing you haven't done. No, I haven't. That's a bad idea. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually you rip on descents. You'd be really good at it. I oh, bet. Um, so no, Chris, like this is normal. First of all, to mm -hmm. feel like you're, uh, uh, what do we want to call it? Like stagnant or the racing experience becomes stale for you. Yeah, totally. That's, and don't feel bad about that either. Like that, that's not something that is on you. That's just the way things go. Um, yeah, I, I feel like for me, if I don't find what sparks joy, like to take a Marie Kondo thing here, <laughs> if I don't find what sparks joy in bike racing, then it is really tough to get motivation. What do we all find? for motivation in terms of like, um, I guess with cycling events in particular, perhaps you can share a moment when you changed that, when like you started focusing on something differently and why you made that decision. Amber, do you have, do you want to lead us off on this? Sure. Um, I've gone through a few different shifts on this front, uh, in cycling in particular. Um, when I got started, I was, you know, a relative beginner and I wasn't on a team. And so I was really, racing for myself and learning race tactics, which was really fun. And I, I really enjoyed that learning curve. Um, but then I shifted to being on a team and being a teammate and being somebody who was really caring more about what was the result of the team versus my own result. And I know that's hard with mountain biking. Um, pardon me wants to recommend that you give road racing a try and find a team and, <laughs> you know, work with some teammates that might not be something that appeals to you. Uh, but now, honestly, I mean, one of the things that has been a common thread throughout my whole career was I, I really enjoy the feeling of being fit. I just do. It feels really good. And I enjoy the process of going from that off season, low level of fitness to a high level of fitness. And so I would encourage you to just think about, you know, what are some other elements about riding that may not even necessarily have to do with racing that might be motivating for you right now. My main motivation is that I want to, I want to feel fit again. I just want to feel like I can hop on my bike and climb up a mountain and feel really good and snappy doing that. And I definitely don't feel like that right now, but I know that I can get there and I know I'm going to enjoy that process. Um, so it, it's a really basic thing. And, you know, if you're looking at a local race series and you want to go, because there's a social component to that, that's great too. You don't necessarily have to race for a win. If it's a similar course that you're racing year after year, you can work on improving your time on that course. I mean, there are other ways of framing even a race scenario where you're not on a team. Um, so I would just suggest get, get creative and see if something, you know, resonates with you. Mm. How about you, Ivy? Um, what would you have to share in this situation for Chris? Uh, <laughs> I'm super transparent in my a uh, lack of motivation pretty <laughs> frequently it happens to me all the time. I just, it varies. Sometimes I'll have a really good month or a good week. And sometimes it changes daily. I have bouts of nihilism and training doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And <laughs> I'll try to get to the bottom of why. Um, sometimes it's just like a rest thing or a nutrition thing. Um, but if the answer isn't obvious, I try really hard not to dig into why and figure out why I'm not motivated because that hasn't really worked for me. Um, if it's not there, I don't know. It seems like just like digging in deeper and trying to figure out why I, I'm not stoked about training and racing and everything doesn't, doesn't work for me. Um, so instead, um, I just try to do change up you know, training structure, see if there's something I can change that will make me more excited about riding or do a different discipline for a little bit. So if I'm doing a lot of training on the road, that can be a little, um, like mind numbing and, mm -hmm. um, just mixing up with a different discipline and doing an off-road ride just for one day without structure can really help me sometimes. So, um, and everyone's different. And for Chris with racing, it sounds like they're doing the same races every year. I wonder if they mean, when they say the same races every year, I wonder if they just mean the same type of discipline or if they're actually doing like the same local series every year. And maybe they just need to mix it up, go find a different race a few hours out of town, make a weekend out of it to keep them excited about something else and other races that are out there. Yeah. I don't think we've ever covered Ivy. What made you change from road racing over to cross? Oh, um, well, 
I broke so many bones. I broke like half the bones in my body and my teeth and everything. <laughs> I was so tired of crashing. And uh, I did really struggle with the motivation to train for what it looked like to be really good at road racing. Um, mm. I just didn't, I wasn't motivated to do it anymore. I didn't want to go ride by myself um, on the road where I was worried about my safety and um, with cars and I wanted to get off of the road and it was too, I just couldn't get motivated to, to be on the road anymore. And, and since then it's now that I do off-road stuff, it's easier to incorporate road rides now that I don't do it all the time. And the motivation, so the motivation is there again. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into off-road. I just was absolutely cracked on road racing and crashing and kind of the culture of road racing and everything that surrounds the training for road. I was just, I was just done and started just like goofing off on an enduro bike. and was like, Oh, I like off-road stuff and I still like pedaling really hard. So, uh, what can I do? Um, yeah. And then cross and sometimes XC happened. Yeah. Um, and so it's normal to have this transition. First of all, Chris, everybody changes. Now, Keegan, in your case, it's like your job to change because of the lifetime <laughs> Grand Prix. Uh, and I mean, I, uh, I guess, I mean, you could also just continue to pursue XCO too. And that could also very much right. be your job, but the, there is this huge opportunity. So like what caused you to shift was it, is it like, and, and by the way, I want to normalize this. It's okay for professional motivation to be the goal. Like, it's okay mm. to say there's more money to, to go here because it's your job. It's like what everybody would do at any job. And it's like, Hey, there's an opportunity to get more money over here. So that's on the table. That's okay to say, but then also like, was there anything more to having you switch from shorter races going into ultra endurance? Maybe this was what you always wanted to do, even though you were doing something else. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's why I've always I've been raced XCO for I me mean, since I was a junior, you know, raced there's like, I just realized the other day, I was like, wow, I've raced like this race, like Mount Saint Anne, the world cup, like the last 10, 12 years in a row. Um, and I'm just, I'm really, I'm excited to do something different, but also like, I think the marathon stuff has always kind of suited me a little bit better. Like I've always, I'd, I'd done, I'm like, man, this is like, I like this. It's more fun to me. I think I'm better at it. Um, but there wasn't really a huge platform for it over here. Like there was a couple of gravel races. There was some longer marathon like there was the Epic Ride series and like some other random stuff here and there, but it wasn't quite as big. Um, and then all of a sudden, like these gravel races, like just appeared, it seemed like, I guess <laughs> they'd always kind of been there, but they just like exploded. Um, and I wasn't really sure what I thought of it. I was like, no, no, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Like I didn't really seem too into it, but I raced one of them. I did the Belgian waffle, uh, the Cedar city one. And I had a ton of fun. I was like, wow, this is really cool. Like there's tactics, there's a lot of fitness. It's long, it's hard. Um, and it's cool. And I think I love these long races because it's really like so much can happen. And it's, if you don't give up and you just like, keep your, keep your head down and keep, keep trucking, like you're going to do well, you know, as long as you don't pull the pin, which I think is kind of a cool style of racing. Like it just, it's really difficult. <laughs> um, yeah. and there's a lot that goes into it. You have to have like, a, you know, pretty good repeatable power. Cause there's like a lot of surges and, but you also have to have just a big diesel motor for how long these events are. Um, so it's kind of a cool balance of a lot of different things. And there's also still like the technical aspect of like handling skills. And I think even though it's relatively easy compared to mountain bike racing, you're still like, you're going fast. And I think it's almost harder in some ways to rip a gravel road quickly, especially when you're kind of shelled. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm actually more motivated this year than I have been in a long time. That's I've never really lacked, like I've never really lacked motivation to train. I think I love training. I love, you know, sometimes I think it's like, like a dog. I just, I need my job. You know, I like to go out and train, work hard, get it done. <laughs> you know, I think you're built Throw different. ball fetch. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> like I love pushing myself and finding like those limits, you know, where like I was thinking that is like, man, I wonder like how many days of a camp like that I could handle before I like completely fell apart. You know, I couldn't even, like, so I guess that's why like, I'm kind of excited for this 24 is it's like such a different, different thing. I love like pushing myself to new, do new things and, um, some new goals, but I, I'm still racing some XCO. Like I'm definitely going to go back and try and defend my XCO national title and short track. Like I think 
still fun. I'm just going to pick and choose the events I want to do now instead of force myself like, Oh, I have to go do this race to get points. And because to me, that isn't quite as much fun. Like I want to do a race because I want to do it. I don't want to like go because I have to, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I'm kind of looking forward to a new challenge and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And then back to the motivation thing with like COVID, like there was no racing and like there was, wasn't much going on and like, I was still motivated to train. So like, I know it's going to help me for next year. So I have to stay fit and like keep building, but along the way you can find other goals too. Like if you don't want to race, maybe like find an FKT you want to go do, or like get some friends together and go like race on a different circuit. Like I understand, like I grew up racing the same Intermountain Cup series in Utah for, you know, as a junior, we race the same races every year. I was like, man, I was so excited when I get to leave the state and go do something else, you know? So I understand what you're, kind of what you're feeling but i think if you can maybe you can find some other events like maybe there's some gravel races you can go do and or maybe there's a road race like amber mentioned like you can learn a lot from those events too i think like road racing and gravel racing you it'll make you a better mountain biker you'll learn tactics and um all that other stuff so i think maybe just find something that motivates you know or if you don't if you don't want to race at all then just train if you're sounds like you're still motivated to train so just mm -hmm. train and then you're probably going to be just as fit or fitter for your state championship if that's your main target like you don't have to race every weekend to be good so yeah and then they'll start winning and then they'll be super motivated and then the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's amazing how that works <laughs> this yeah. the common theme that i'm finding is that so it's and this is absolutely okay as well but when races are nearby, they're accessible and we do them and it becomes a fun routine and we know the people there and that just becomes part of it. But sometimes uh, maybe we, instead of looking at events that are just close to us or they're there, or we've done them before, we should instead look at events that really like actually make us excited or right. challenge us in a particular way that motivates us. Right. So it's okay to do that. It's okay to change things up. So Chris, and I'm, I'm, boy, like having an event on the calendar is a great way to manage motivation. The next question from David really goes into more uh, kind of things on consistency and tying into motivation too. But having an event that makes you excited on the calendar is great. Having an event that doesn't make you excited on the calendar makes it really tough to push through those days when you don't want to be out there uh, or push through those days when... Um, uh, yeah. Or I guess just give your best on days when it's tempting to just not give your best, you know, yeah. and then you have something that you're excited about. It totally changes it. Sometimes you build out, like you build out your race calendar and you're like, oh, I'm excited to do this, this, and this. And then like, as you get closer, you're like, no, that just doesn't sound fun. Like, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, like I always do that. I have like my full, like I have an Excel sheet with all my races and then I'll like put them in, put them on the calendar. And as you get closer, I'm like, man, this is like, I, I don't want to do this. I'd rather just go train and just go <laughs> ride with my friends. So like, sometimes you, can, you don't have to do it if you don't want to it's just a bike race like there's other things you can do you know just focus on the really ones you really want to do and then you'll be more excited for those yeah for sure let's go into david's question he says since consistency is so important for long-term progress thank you david we say that so much um mm -hmm. everyone wants to know what the secret uh interval workout is to do or the secret training plan or anything else and it's just consistency. In fact, uh, Niels Vanderpool, one of the best speed skaters in the world in the 5k and 10k distances this year, or just recently he released, like, basically like he documented all the training that he does on the bike, which spoiler alert, I think he trains on the bike more than most pro cyclists. It's insane. <laughs> um, and he talks a lot about what he does, but if you look at it, the main thing is he is so consistent. And if you look at it just over time, he finds ways to make himself more consistent. Um, it's a common thing that we see across the best athletes. Same thing with Keegan. I mean, he just doesn't miss. Like he's just always out there doing things. And Amber with your geez, the amount of consistency you had with your swimming career and every, you know, consistency works. So he says, can mm -hmm. each of you give some tips on what things you've learned over the years that have helped you maintain consistency? What have you learned that has helped you maintain consistency consistency in the face of illness, fatigue, life, stress, lack of ambition, and the opposite too much ambition. <laughs> uh, thanks from David. Amber, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I think so. I, I want to start answering this question by uh, talking about the idea of discipline, because I think the discipline is in, very much tied in with the idea of consistency. Like in order to be consistent, you have to be disciplined and discipline. I think for most people relates to this idea of willpower. Like you have to will yourself to be consistent all the time. And if you're really disciplined, it means you have a really strong will. And if you're not consistent, it's because you're not disciplined and you don't have a strong will. And I want to challenge that because I think 
instead of feeling like you have to will yourself to be consistent and disciplined, it's more about removing obstacles to consistency. Um, and for me, discipline is much more about finding a reason to want to go out than finding the willpower to force yourself to go out and train. Mm. So if you can identify a way of wanting to go out and figure out, and this kind of ties back to what we were just talking about with motivation, what's getting in the way. So how many obstacles to getting out to train can you remove? Can you set up everything the night before? Can you, um, there, there's so many, so many ways that you can remove friction to getting out and getting your workouts done. And it's, so it's not just about, oh, I don't have enough willpower to do this. It's, Hey, you might have a lot of things stacked against you right now. Lots of life stress, um, logistics might be really difficult or tricky. There's a lot that goes into being consistent that has nothing to do with willpower at all. So mm. I would challenge you to think about this in terms of what obstacles and friction can you remove rather than how can I be more disciplined or exert more willpower? Mm. Ivy, you, uh, I mean, you're in Sacramento right now with the squid bikes crew. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that kind of like what Amber's talking about? Like you, are you implementing that very thing here? Yeah, very much. So, uh, <laughs> having a support circle and, uh, people that want to train with me has helped me with consistency so much. And I know for me having a routine that we all follow together. Um, and sometimes I have to break away from that. If I, um, if training goals don't align with align with having tag alongs, but, um, having a routine when I train has helped me a lot. Um, because when I used to, um, kind of like watch the weather and, uh, see how the day went. And, um, I, I would struggle with consistency all the time. Like I'd push it back and like find some project and, uh, never start at the same time. And then my nutrition is weird and messed up. The timing is weird. Um, and I didn't get as much out of the workouts and it was hard to stay consistent. So, um, now when I start my workouts in the late afternoon, it's not ideal. And I do a lot of my training with lights in the dark sometimes, but I've spent all day, uh, structuring my nutrition in a way that really helps me do those workouts in the afternoon better. Um, I feel like I accomplish a lot during the day. So when I'm training, I don't stress out about having to rush back or mm. being late for a meeting or thinking about all the things that I like need to do that day or wish I would have done it. Having that routine sets me up to, uh, be consistent and not even have to think about it. The structure is there. Keegan, mm -hmm. when I was, uh, so it was a camp for me, but it was just a normal, probably a light week for you. Uh, but <laughs> earlier in December, I came out and I just tried to ride behind you for a week. And it's always impresses me to see how top athletes like the three of you have everything designed around removing friction for training. Like, <clears throat> like you, as soon as you got done, you like did all the maintenance that you needed to do. If it was a little bit of maintenance or more maintenance, whatever it was, like you did that right when you finished your training. So then your bike was just done. You like had kit figured out, you had food figured out, you eat so much. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and like you do all these things just to make training easier. And the like your lifestyle is 100% built around it. Now for yeah. the, and is that something, are you constantly searching for ways to improve that? Or is that just simply like, it's been habit for so long now that that just is what it is. It's funny. I think most of it is just kind of evolved to find the most efficient, um, most efficient way to do it. Maybe not the most efficient, but the way I like to do it and the way I think it works the best for me. Um, cause really like my job is to go train. So sure. There's maybe some days where I don't want to go train if the weather's bad or whatever, but like you just, you go, you just go do it because that's what you have to do. <laughs> and in general, I try and have like the same kind of schedule, like wake up around like seven or eight, have breakfast, try and ride before 11. Normally, um, I just have like, try and get back, have my recovery shake, have lunch, dinner, stretch, sleep. Like kind of like during base season this time of year, I guess all year round, I just do enough volume, but like, it's kind of the same. I just kind of get in this groove and I just like having consistency. Like when there's something that like makes me ride in the afternoon, I really, I don't like it. <laughs> 
Like I, I try to avoid <laughs> that at all costs, unless it's a recovery spin. Sometimes I like, I'll wait till the evening and do my ride in the afternoon. I'm just like do emails, whatever I have to do in the morning, I'll do that. But for like proper training rides, everything else gets like set aside. Like that is my job. So I, I make sure that's the priority and I find like the nicest part of the day to, to do that into, um, you know, if it's going to rain in the morning, I'll maybe, maybe I'll push my training off till noon and be like, okay, I knew from noon till five or whatever it's going to be. I think like, yeah, be somewhat flexible, right. And adjust it as needed. Um, yeah. In general, I think it just kind of this like system I've evolved and like, it's not super rigid as you saw, like, you know, Russell and we were talking, talking trash <laughs> on me being like 15 minutes late. Like you get just, roasted <laughs> constantly for that. <laughs> I, you know, that's just my plan. Like I get ready and I go and when I go and <laughs> he's like that, he's like that, uh, me and Pablo Escobar standing out there and like checking, like, like looking yeah. ponderously out at the, out at the weather. That's Keegan. He just steps outside on his porch to see if the weather is ideal. And that's what defines it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it makes a difference, like having all that stuff pretty dialed, you know, like I think as a pro athlete, if you get too much else going on in your life and you're trying to do this and that, and your training isn't perfect then like eventually like sure you, not every day has to be perfect but it does add up and if you're missing you miss one day a week and you miss two days a week and then maybe you only do three hours one day instead of five and like that stuff adds up and i think for me like i try and focus on being as consistent as possible and doing what my coach tells me to do every day and then if i have a bad race it's because i did something wrong not because i didn't do my training like i think I just always do the work and if something goes wrong, then it's, that's on me. And I know that wasn't like, it wasn't my coach's fault. And while I wasn't fit enough, like I think I'm always fit enough to perform at races. It's just a matter of executing. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah. I've, I've been Keegan have covered three key things that I just want to emphasize really quick for people listening. Cause these are three really good ways to remove friction from your training. One is training buddies having an accountability buddy is huge. It makes it so much more fun and much more motivating to get out. So if there's somebody who is on a similar training plan to you or wants to ride on the same day as you at the same time, dial that in. Cause that or makes even it a Amber. ton more fun. An yeah. additional thing too, is like, you don't even have to ride together with them. Cause a lot of us are like, the only time we have to train because of family and job and everything else is super early in the morning. You can do group workouts with trainer road. If somebody's yeah. doing the same workouts, but even then just having a person that you'd like, like, I mean, Keegan uh, and I are friends, but like we text each other about our workouts all the time. It's like, <laughs> I got this today. And then afterward, we're like, that was awesome. It's like, it's this little thing of just, you can even just talk to your friends about your workouts instead of doing them with yeah. them. You can even just have somebody to, to share that with. And that really does help. Like it, it adds another layer of accountability for sure. Especially when they right. hook you up. Like, yeah, exactly. Good, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. So the yep. social component is huge. The second thing Keegan talked about getting the workouts done early in the morning. And I think this is really key for a lot of reasons and not just because of the weather. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> I'm an afternoon gal. <laughs> Depends on the person, but I will say, um, decision-making fatigue is a real thing. So as you mm -hmm. go through your day, you're going to have to make certain decisions. And if you're making the decision to go outside and train later in the day, that gets harder and harder to decide to do. Um, okay. and that's one of the things that I think a lot of people, I, I definitely struggle with this. So if there's something, if I'm trying to build a new habit, for example, I want to try to do that in the morning. Cause it's a lot easier to decide to do that thing while I'm creating that habit. And then that leads me to the third thing, which is the more you can make your training habit, there's so much less friction because you're no longer deciding to do something. It becomes automatic. So like Keegan, handling any mechanical needs that the bike might, where the bike might need attention immediately after the ride. I'm sure that's not even something that you think about anymore. You make a note in your head during the ride that, you know, chain needs a little bit of lube. I want to adjust my shifting a little bit. When I get back, boom, you do it. You're not even making a decision about it. It's just a mm -hmm. habit. So thinking about your training in terms of building really good habits, establishing those habits. So they're no longer decisions that will remove a ton of friction for you. Mm -hmm. Going along with that <clears throat> for indoor training in particular, making sure that your bike is set up, making sure that your, whatever needs to be charged is charged. Like your fans in place, a simple thing. I swear, like getting a, it's like $5 on Amazon. You can get a remote or like outlet switch for your fan. Like 
there's little things you can do that just make your training inside so much easier. And it mm -hmm. just makes it a, like an automatic process. Now, like in train row, we've made it so that the app just loads and you'd see your workout and you can just go rather than having to find your workout. Um, coming soon, we're working on a thing where if you're for some reason on the website, looking at your workout instead of in the app, and you go, you'll be able to hit load workout and it'll just open it in the app and you'll just be ready to go. It remembers your devices. So they're always paired. So you don't have to go through that again. Like we've done a lot of different things within the app experience to do that very thing, to, to remove decisions from it. So, and just make it habit or automate it. So it's already taken care of. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. And I'm, I feel really fortunate too, because my, my wife, in my case, she's like a fantastic accountability partner with this too. She'll ask me like, what's your workout tomorrow? And then, and then on top of that, she'll be like, is there anything that I need to do to be able to make it easier? And then I ask the same thing for her. And that's just how we, so <clears throat> don't be afraid to lean on people. And if you mm -hmm. have them there, um, if you don't have them there, lean on them digitally. I know that that may seem like disjointed and a bit strange, but like there's, there's somebody that you can reach out to that cares about you and your training for sure. Um, even though it's a small thing. So tag us, tag us in yeah. your posts about your workouts. We'll hype you up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I want to take a moment to talk about the times where everything's taken care of, everything's set. Let's say that we have the perfect routine all set up, but then we are just struggling to get out the door. And I want to talk about a line where we all draw the line between self-care and allowing yourself the leniency to skip the workout. And then at the same time, holding yourself accountable to the goals that you had and just getting yourself out the door to get it done. Uh, Keegan, you're like, a, you're, you're, I would classify you as like the tough love type. Like that, that's like what resonates with you. Like just harden up, get out there and do it, get it done. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Amber, I think that you have done a fantastic job at changing the narrative on our podcast and saying that like, Hey, like. You don't just have to drive yourself into the ground. You've done a great job on that too, Ivy, because there are some people that tough love themselves into absolute burnout and just like total lack of productivity. Like there's nothing productive mm -hmm. going on with the training. They're out there, they're struggling through, they're failing workouts constantly, yet they're continually doing it. So yeah. I first want to ask Keegan, where do you draw your line at saying like, no, I do need to skip today. Like and how do you wrestle with the emotional side of that, of feeling like you failed because you didn't go out and get that scheduled workout done? Um, well, honestly, it doesn't, like, I just, I guess that doesn't really happen, to be honest. Like, I, <laughs> like, Typical, I just, unbelievable. <laughs> just, I just, I just do it. Um, sometimes, like, I don't want to do it, but the fear of, like, doing that and the consequences that might have me like losing a race or like losing fitness or whatever. I just like, I think for me, like I'm a competitor and I like to win and that's like, I love riding my bike. I enjoy just going and having fun. But I think for me, like winning is like the biggest thing. Like that is why I race bikes. So even if I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it because I know it's going to make me win down the road. Um, and maybe that's not like, the healthiest thing or whatever, but it works for me. And I like, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna do this workout. It's raining. I have like five by fives, which is my least favorite workout. I hate it. I'd rather do anything else. But Amber's famous for that too. Yeah. But I'll I'll go do it. You know, like whatever. It's fine. It's, I'll go do it. And um yeah. So I guess like as long as everything like as everything's everything's going okay and I feel good, like I'll continue, but let's say like after that big nine day block, um, Jim, my coach had put, I think I had two or three recovery days before having like a two hour endurance day, which is also basically your recovery day, right? It's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I was like, man, after one, after one recovery day or after two days, I was like, man, I still feel like a little bit tired. Like the text him was like, I'm just going to push this two hour endurance day off another day. And we're going to do one more day of recovery. I think I need it. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. Like, so I think you have to know like you can push yourself really hard and you can like ride yourself into the ground, which I definitely do, but you also have to know like when to draw the line and like a two hour endurance ride is not going to give you any fitness. Like it's 70 TSS for me. It's like, it's not that big a deal. Recovery ride is like 20 to 30 TSS. It's like you're splitting hairs at that point, but like their extra recovery, <laughs> yeah. like the extra recovery mental and physically from that recovery ride is actually going to make, make me faster 
So mm -hmm. I'm going to push that endurance ride off one more day. Like and to me, a, a two hour or three hour endurance ride is just like, it's a filler workout, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's just something to keep the TSS up a little while like kind of recovering, but not really training. So I think, and I kind of know that, like, I know like Jim put that in there as like, ah, oh, maybe if he's not feeling good, he'll just swap it or he'll just text me or whatever. So I think you have, if you're going to be like tough on yourself, you also have to be smart and know like where to draw the line and not like pound yourself into the ground, you know? Um, so yeah, it's definitely hard, but I think you get, you get better at it, but it's definitely like rare for me to swap workouts or just not do one. Like if I have like those five by fives, I was just talking about, if I see those on the calendar, I dread them all week. And I'm like, I don't, don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, but I'll go <laughs> do it. And maybe, maybe I blow up after three and then I'll try and do another two. And, you know, sometimes you gotta know too, like you get, sometimes, you know, you have to push through a workout and sometimes you have to know when to pull the pin and go home. Um, which is always, it's always hard, right? Like I always text, text Jim, like, Hey, like I blew up after one, one, one rep today. I think I'm just going to call it. And some like, but if you get, so if you can't make it through one, then obviously you're still fatigued and you're tired. So you shouldn't do it. But if you can make it through three, then you can probably make it through two more. So you, you just keep going. So I think, <laughs> Science. I, yeah. so I think there's a balance, you know, I can't imagine what would have to happen to you to be like, all right, I'm going to pull a plug today. Like, yeah. It must be really yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. As Ivy said, built different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> how, how I have do a you... process for this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Ivy. Uh, if I, if everything's set up right for consistency and everything's ready to go and I have trouble getting out the door, I try to look at why. And if it's, if it's just that um, I'm a little tired or a little fatigued, I have a rule, which is that I give myself 25 minutes of writing to see what's going on. And that doesn't mean that I have to start my intervals or anything. I just have to, especially if I'm kitted up and just can't get out the door, um, I try to just do the first 25 minutes, get my legs moving and like see if being outside and or, or being on the trainer and starting makes me, those sensations go away. But if it's something like I might be getting sick or uh, not feeling good or might be dealing with an injury, something like that, it, that's different. Um, I might not start the ride, but that's generally my rule. If I'm just like, eh, I don't know, I'm kind of tired, uh, mm. it's getting late, I'll, I'll, or just not feeling it, I'll start 25 minutes and see how it goes. It's amazing yeah. how like after that first like, Sometimes it takes like, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, somewhere around there, but you, you feel like a different person, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it even takes more than that. You know, like sometimes it takes like a solid for me. Sometimes it'll take an hour or two before like you feel good on the bike. I got in that nine day block we did. Like I felt there's a couple of days I woke up and I just felt horrible. Like it hurt to walk around the house. My legs hurt. Everything just ate. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you get out there and you start, you start riding. And once you kind of warm up and you get the blood flowing and like you're fine. Like, oh, I can, I can do this. We're good. And then you just keep going. And that makes times you do need to push through it for a little while, then it'll get better. But like Ivy said, you have to know, like if you're getting sick or if like you have an injury and your knees, like actually hurting, just pushing through is just going to make it worse. Like you're not going to do any, you're not, you're just going to do more damage, more harm than good. So I think you have to figure out, figure out where to draw that line. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with Ivy. I have the same rule. And, and I think, um, an important distinction here is that when you are training at a really high level for a really long time, um, like Ivy, Keegan, me, Jonathan, you get to a point where you are really, really good at knowing when you need to back off. So there are mm -hmm. some days where I would just know like, nope, not training today or today. I just need to ride endurance. I'm not going to do any intervals. Um, and I would know a hundred percent, this is the right decision. But then there are those days where I'm not a hundred percent sure. And I really, <laughs> I'm, I'm genuinely not sure if I'm just kind of tired. And like Ivy said, I'll feel better after I get on the bike or if I really need to dial it back. And I had the same rule as Ivy. I gave myself 20 minutes. <laughs> that was my rule. Yeah. Same thing. It was like, okay, I'm going to go through the motions, get over that initial friction of getting on the bike, see if I feel better. Cause some days, you know, you, you ride into it and you're like, Oh, I'm so glad I got out today. And other days it's like, Nope, this is not happening. And at least then I could take the day off and not feel guilty about it. Like I wouldn't spend the whole day racking my brain, wondering, you know, should I have trained today? Am I just being lazy? Am I, you know, no, then, then I, I gave myself a chance to see, I know for sure 
rest is the right call today. And I can feel really, really good about that decision. So um, if you're a person who knows yourself really, really well, then get comfortable, get comfortable making those calls and trusting yourself. And if you don't know yourself really well, and this is something that you're still trying to figure out that 20, 25 minute rule is a really good way to start learning. What are the sensations that warrant a day off for sure? And then what are the sensations that are maybe just me needing to get out and have a longer warm up today? Um, but it can help to take notes on this stuff, but really pay attention to that. Cause it's a valuable thing to learn about yourself. One thing even Oh, oh, Keegan, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, and even being like, I've, yeah, I've been a professional for the last, like, you know, 10, 12 years now racing. And I still, I still make mistakes. You know, like a few weeks ago, actually over a month ago, like I was feeling like a little bit sick and I was like, ah, it's fine. Like, it's not that big a deal. Just like, it's probably just, you know, it is what it's fine. <laughs> so I went out and had a hard, like five hour endurance day and I started feeling off. I was like, man, I don't know, I feel a little off. And then like halfway through, I started to feel like this is really, really hard. Like trying to do like 250 Watts felt like full gas. And I was like, man, this probably, I probably shouldn't have even came out today. And afterward, I, mean, I just, and then I got really sick afterward. And I just was like, oh, I shouldn't oh. have, been. if I had not trained that ride, then maybe I think it would have been better. But I like, so I think it's hard to, it's hard to differentiate sometimes. Like, oh, like sometimes it's hard to find that balance of like when you should go out and mm -hmm. when you shouldn't, and maybe you should just do an easy spin instead of a hard ride. But like sometimes once you're committed to it, you're like, ah, oh, like I'll ride through it. Like give a couple of hours, I'll warm up. Like, you know, so it's like, you still make mistakes, you know, it happens, you know, I try and like get better about it, but it's just not everyone knows it's perfect. So like, don't, if you, sometimes you have to make those mistakes in order to learn, even if you make them every year, eventually yep. you'll learn. <laughs> and because of lifestyle changes and because of training changes and everything else, you'll also have new baselines that you'll have to calibrate to. Like right now right. doing uh triathlon training, uh, I've, been complaining about this to Keegan. We're like, turns out triathlon training is really hard. Uh, like when you swim and you run, it makes bike hard. So, uh, that's been like, <laughs> so that's been something that's new to ad like adjust to. It's like, Oh, okay. So like, I should just feel like right now, like I'm getting used to this different level of fatigue. It's not necessarily more, not necessarily less. It's just different. And I feel mm -hmm. different coming into workouts. Right. So, and if you change your training volume or change the focus of your training, you're doing a different type of work or, get a new job or you have something else change outside of just the cycling training portion of your life, you have to kind of like normalize to that. So you have to kind of like feel things out for a while and then regain your confidence and your ability to be able to assess those situations. So, um, it's all, it's all part of it. The one thing I do want to hammer home that's so important, especially for all of us is I am a firm believer in the earlier you can get your training in, in the day, the less obstacles will stand in your way to getting it done. I'm seeing it in the live chat right now. People are saying this too, that like, yeah, like I plan my training for the afternoon. And then by that time, you know, I have a kid that's sick or I had to go and do this errand or my work, you know, threw a huge like fire drill at me and I had to totally mm -hmm. change everything that I had planned. And there goes your training. And when that happens time after time, after time, it can be really frustrating and demotivating. And you can't like will your way through that because it's like, well, no, I like, I literally have to work for six more hours right now and I can't do it. Or I have to take care of a sick child, whatever the situation might be. All of us probably face those where we simply can't overcome them. So it's one of those times where you have to stop and think like, okay, so is the problem everything else or is the problem that I'm trying to pose an unrealistic expectation of being able to have a very consistent life to work around my training? And that's probably where it lies. So instead you just have to think, okay, so where can I position my training in a spot where it is less prone to influence or be influenced by all these variables. Right. So training in the morning is really hard, but it does beat not training. Right. So, um, as long as it's, you know, something that's sustainable for you, let's get into some rapid fire questions. What's your favorite bike color and which is fastest? We'll go Amber Ivy Keegan in that rotation on these Amber. I'm a big fan of the ombres I've been seeing. I'll just say Ooh, that the fades. Mm-hmm. Is that fastest? Yeah. If it looks good, it's fastest. Yeah. 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 Silly question to add to two in the Silly same. question. Yeah, yeah. Ivy. I don't know what's fastest, but the cool thing about squid bikes is that you can paint them. I'm currently in the process of sandblasting and stripping, uh, my two race bikes and I get to repaint them. Um, so one of them is going to be very 
2008 pop punk splattered vibes. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, I dig it. Keegan. Uh, black. <laughs> yeah. uh, what i would expect yeah wait uh, wait, wait, wait matt or gloss matt because it's lighter yeah i just i just love the look of a black bike i think it just look really cool I, I don't mind little splashes of color like one of my blurs is black with a little bit of like kind of orangey color orangey pinkish color for the logo i think that looks cool um but in general i just I'm a fan of kind of just dark black but i think this look good they always look good and they always yeah. will i don't think like colors come and go and like there's different styles of color that like kind of come and go throughout the years but i think black bikes have always looked cool and i think yeah they always will yeah agreed black bikes are always uh i, I like them best i'm sure that somebody out there <clears throat> is going like dad joke opportunity or nerd joke op- i think red is technically the fastest color like actually <laughs> as a color in terms of like light and frequency and such so there we go but yeah black bikes uh, will keegan use arrow bars for gravel racing we don't have to go in a round on this one this one's just for keegan because <laughs> that's a that's a controversial point coming from it's mr kabush friend of the I mean, podcast i don't know probably not but i might like i'm not counting it out i might test some i like i'm not here to like enjoy and have a good like i'm not here to have a good time racing gravel but i'm also here to win and if i if it arrow bars mean i'm gonna win then i'm gonna use them so i'm not gonna say no but as much as like, I would, like, I don't, I don't think they're cool or anything. And I think they should just say, <laughs> I think like the whole gravel, like all the series should just be like, you can't use arrow bars. And that would solve so many problems because then no one can use them and it's fine. And then no one looks bad. It doesn't look it's like safer. Like, so I don't, I do agree. I don't think arrow bars have a place in like groups. I think like they're sketchy and they can cause crashes. And I think like, if you're going to use them, you have to really know when it's safe to use them when, when it's not safe to use them. And I think a lot of people have a hard time with that. So I think they should just say you can't use them, but since it's allowed, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's faster. Whatever's faster. How do you deal with riding? Oh, wait, one, one quick thing. I forgot to do this at the beginning, but uh, congrats to friend of the podcast, Mateo Jorgensen, um, movie star rider. He got third, I believe, at Tour de la Provence, I believe. I could be mixing it up with a different race, but third on a mountaintop stage. And it's cool because Mateo is not like a short, tiny, little, stereotypical, like, world tour climber. Yeah, he was smashing. He he blew past, awesome. blew past Julian Alaphilippe, which is pretty darn cool. So uh, it's always uh, – and, yes, we're from the United States of America, of course, so it's really <laughs> – uh, we like to be able to cheer for our riders in the pro tour. It uh, We don't get as many chances to cheer as, you know, the French or Italians or anybody else. So good job, Matteo. Way to go. Uh, Keegan, how do you deal with riding with having fresh tattoos? And when do you start riding again? You don't get tattoos though. If Sophia is listening to this, you don't get tattoos. Mm. So no, yeah. never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you uh, deal with them? I mean, I guess, um, I mean, I wouldn't get a tattoo and go out and train right away, but I'll get one the day before. And then, I mean, it's as long as you keep it clean. And I like to use Tegaderm or Saniderm, keep it covered. The bubble. And then, yeah, then put like, I like to use like the, like the arm warmers that aren't like the sun sleeve things, if they're on your arms. Um, I don't, it's good to keep them out of the sun. I mean, it's basically like a really gnarly sunburn. So if you're getting sun on it, then it really hurts and it can just mess it up and that um but also i'm not a doctor i'm not your tattoo artist so don't ask me <laughs> <laughs> I'm, this one comes from somebody who says their name is i'm self-conscious about asking too many questions that's actually what they said their name Aww. is so uh, they say we do i need questions. to take yeah that's really it's called ask <laughs> a cycling coach podcast <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do i need to take recovery weeks if i'm only doing one to two training rides a week probably three to four hours training time i will check i will chess not checkers on this one with you uh i'm self-conscious about asking too many questions uh, since that's your name it's not about whether you should take one or not just based on frequency it's about dose so is this sufficient dose the three to four hours training time so that you feel like you're getting fatigued after three to four weeks then you need a recovery week Mm -hmm. so people that train less days don't necessarily not need recovery weeks it's just the point of a recovery week is to give your body a chance to deload basically. So Mm -hmm. the stress decreases a bit and you can catch up to the adaptations that you should be making along the way. And then you, you know, restart. So 
you know, one to two days doesn't mean that you might not. It also might mean, yes, it's not enough stress for you. And as a result, you don't need a recovery week, but that's the whole point of it. Uh, this one I think is from key or for Keegan too. is soul crushing an innate skill or one that can be developed. <laughs> I think you can develop it. You just need to learn, <laughs> like to learn people's weaknesses and learn how to like, you know, rub some salt in their wounds. And I think you can figure it <laughs> yeah. out racing, you know, like sometimes it has been, I to think it helps you win mental games. Like you can like learn how to just make people hurt and make you think, make them think that you aren't hurting. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a lot that goes into it, but I think there's a lot more to bike racing than just fitness. I think like mental is half the battle. So if you can make someone think that you aren't hurting and they are, then you've already beat them. So that's the fun learn. part. Yeah, <laughs> it is fun. <laughs> yeah. And keep in mind fun. when you line up for a bike race, everyone there is consenting to competition. So yes, it's a fun arena where you get to do this stuff and you get to adopt this mindset and, and, play, you know? So, um, I, I just want to share a quick quote. When I first started bike racing, my then boyfriend, now husband, who was racing as a cat one at the time, uh, he had a saying, which was the bicycle is a tool, a surgical tool to remove another man's dignity. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's a good quote. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That, that resonates with me as well. Does. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Yeah. Make them wish yeah. they weren't bike racers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. It's a big motivation. Like I think like if I can make the people that showed up or that raced with me, if I can make them on the way home say, I just shouldn't have even come. I wish I didn't, I wish I didn't even show up. That's like oh, they know you've really won. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there's oh, winning God. the race and then there's winning the race, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ivy. <laughs> no, it's okay. I I'm not trying to um like toot my own horn, but um there were some uh smaller level like local cross races um where after i showed up and went up to register um someone just left they already <laughs> registered no! and they left and I was, I was like damn sorry you, you won before you won before you won yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i mean no nobody should just turn around because somebody shows up you're no. showing up to do battle that's the point right like it's fun and like you said amber it's like a light. It's like, once you enter that competitive arena, it's a license to do that. Like, like it's, it's physical, mm -hmm. it's mental, it's psychological, the whole thing like that. That's what it is. I, and even I if you're the person, that. right. Even if you're the person who is probably going to be the nail and not the hammer that day, there's still so much that you can learn from that really genuinely. You can be focusing on process goals. You can focus on watching the the higher level mm -hmm. riders and watch, watch how they execute, watch what they do, learn from them. So, um, I, I encourage everybody, you know, competition can be really fun because there's this really cooperative effort in learning how to get better as an athlete. So mm -hmm. no matter what you can teach somebody else, somebody, something, and no matter what you can learn something from somebody else. So, um, mm -hmm. get out there and have fun learning about it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good, good way to say it, Amber. Uh, what is your favorite bar, or what is your preferred bar width on road and mountain bikes? Let's go Amber Ivy Keegan. Ooh. Uh, I don't know if you have a oh, mountain bike one that, you know, mountain of, bike, like I, I don't even know. I, I don't yeah. know what it is on the mountain bike, but on the road, I, I like wide bars. So I ride 42 centimeters center to center. Yep. Which actually comes like standard on some bikes, but for women's bikes, they usually give you really narrow bars. 38s. So, yeah. 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 I ride 38s on the road but, uh, 42s or 44s for cross, um, mm. and seven 40 for XC. Nice. Keegan. Um, 40 or 42 on the road. I have 40s on my gravel bike and 42 on the road. We've been like going back and forth. I think I like the forties better. So I'm going to transition that way. Um, and then 720 on the cross country bikes and 740 on the enduro bikes. Mm -hmm. and e-bikes and whatever so i'm 40s on the road uh if i was racing cyclocross i'd probably be 42s um and then if i'm on the mountain bike i like 720 for xc so same as keegan i guess um 740 for enduro stuff which i know like somebody out there is like 
what are you doing? You need to have 800 millimeter wide bars. Richie Rude, who is an absolute tank of a human. He's like two humans put together, like in terms of his like <laughs> shoulder width. It's absurd. He runs seven forties. So there you go. If he can do it, I think that the whole argument of like shoulder width and bars, and I'm a big, massive, masculine man. Therefore I must have 800 millimeter wide bars. I think that that's like absolutely an implication that you're hoping that we catch on to with your like wide bar width. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's broken. Cause it's gonna get Richie's, in the way. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to hit trees. He's going to do everything else. I think Richie manages to do it pretty well. So <clears throat> if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Uh, another question. How often do you and Sophia ride together? And once again, we'll just target this one to Keegan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> never. My answer is never. I never <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much, pretty much we don't. Um, <laughs> maybe like once every two weeks or so. The or shootout. Plus. The well, shootout, you ride together yeah. to the shootout. We'll ride together to the shootout um if recovery days line up sometimes we'll do those together um sometimes she'll jump on and, and kind of motor pace me on like a hard endurance day which works pretty well because my hard endurance pace if it's flat is also like hers if she's in the draft which is mm -hmm. good um i think it's kind of good i mean for her it's like she can motor pace any day of the week behind me which is like i think pretty good advantage i think um yeah. you can watch get used out to sophia's competition also you can like yeah, you know, average a few miles an hour faster on the road. So then we can do, she can do bigger loops and kind of do some stuff that like, maybe she isn't possible in four hours alone. You know what I mean? So yep. I think it's yeah. uh yeah, those are, even those are rare. She only hops on here and there. So, cause she knows that she's just along for the ride. If she gets dropped, then that's, <laughs> she's on her own. <laughs> There's no waiting. Um, yeah. I think it's funny. We say like a lot of our competition, like they'll train together, but I think for us, like, I mean, we live together, spend a lot of time together. It's like, that's our job. So I think of it as like, unless it works out that both of us can do our job together, then someone, either she's riding too hard or I'd be riding too easy. So yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, I'm excited to see how Sophia does this year. Watch out everybody who's going to race Sophia. She's yeah. going to be firing. So um, could Amber beat jo Jonathan in a triathlon? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No question. Keegan loves the fact that I suck at swimming. He's just you like to hold his head in water for a second. You could pass him and just like <laughs> <laughs> like yesterday I was swimming next to this guy who had a UCLA cap on, right? And when I'm swimming, I literally feel the current from when he blows by me, like in both oh, directions. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> it rocks the boat. It rocks the boat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, man, I'm so slow, but Hey, I'm getting to the point yesterday. I did, uh, I swam my first K so thousand meters or a thousand yards. Uh, so I'm thousand yards and it was doing, and it was too flat basically for a hundred time on that. So I'm not trying to swim fast. In fact, I'm like consciously trying to swim slow, if that makes sense, because I'm just trying to be comfortable, build awareness and build that proprioception to be able to be like, because before when you're drowning, it's actually really hard to tell what your lat is doing, for example. <laughs> so you don't really care about what your lats are doing and how they're engaging uh, when you're drowning. So uh, now I'm getting to the point where I can actually start to feel things better, where I'm like, okay. I actually do feel that like I could be straighter here or I am twisting and bending at my hips and instead I need to do this. So I'm actually trying to swim slow, but Hey, I'm already a pretty rapid improvement. So you're right drowning. On. So I, <laughs> Keegan's going to do an Ironman triathlon one at some point too. Um, it's on the list. We talked about this. Yep. Yeah. So we'll do that. And then I'll smoke you, Keegan. How about that? You probably will. I'm not a very good <laughs> swimmer. Faster I'm swimmer, not a very good runner. Even though your mom was like a, a high level collegiate swimmer, right? I mean, I can swim. Like I was, I swam competitively when I was a kid. So like, I think it would probably come back. I just really, I don't like it. I don't like water. I don't like, I don't like being in it. So I don't like, <laughs> you're like, um, I don't like you're, bathing, Labrador, you're like a Labrador. No. <laughs> yeah. He's a Labrador on the bike where it's just like throw ball, chase ball, go get ball. That's like Keegan. And then, but he hates water at the same time. So you've broken the Labrador thing. I don't, yeah. and, and then running, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I can run, but I don't think I'm very good at it. Like I seem horribly inefficient, you know, like I, I feel like running a five minute mile is like pretty much full gas, but then I feel like I can run like seven minute pace for a long time. It just like, I think yeah. my, my, uh, technique would need a little bit of love, the hot, 
the Hoff would he'd be able to help me out though. Yeah. Cause he would absolutely destroy me on the bike. You would probably destroy me on the swim. And I don't know if I could beat you on the run. So, but I still, I'm going to hold on to hope. I'm going to smash you in an Ironman one day and that will be so much fun. I will rub it in your face for so long if that happens. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, next one. Who's more punk rock Keegan or Ivy. If Ivy's painting her bike to be 08, like, emo I have to punk say rock, Ivy. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. no, I, I'm going to say Ty because, uh, Keegan in terms of music taste for sure. Um, maybe me in terms of like (laughs) anti-authoritarianism, but Keegan music taste, absolutely more punk rock. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Keegan likes his punk rock stuff. Do you object to any of that Keegan or no, you're good. No, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. I just do my thing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm going to direct this one to Amber. Is it okay to take a break during the ramp test? Short answer. No. Um, so it, it's, it's a protocol for a reason and, and it's gonna, it's designed this way. So it's meant to be really hard. Um, and it's not meant to be an interval session. It's, mm-hmm. it's a ramp test. Um, uh, but if you dislike that, you can now use our AI FTP detection. Uh, yeah. so you don't have to take the ramp test at all. So you can actually yes. take a break through the whole thing and go do <laughs> a workout. That's more fun. That does give you intervals with breaks. Um, so if you want to do that, just head over to your trainer road account on the website go to your account, go to early access, click on enable where you see AI FTP detection. And the next time you have a ramp test, when it's your next workout on the career page, you'll see a little button, new one that mm-hmm. says use FTP detection. You can just hit that button. Um, we'll give you what we think your predict- predicted FTP is. You can accept that and go do another workout from Pretty Salt. Neat, eh, Keegan? They can figure mm-hmm. all that stuff out. Easy. Yeah. You just go do it. You don't, have to, <laughs> you don't have to do it. You can do you it. You don't have to actually yeah. do it. It just tells you what it is. DC, Ray, <laughs> DC Raymaker shared yesterday on his stories that he put a ramp test on his calendar. And then, so he took the ramp test and he said, so I clicked and it was done and it was the best test he'd ever taken. He said something like that. So <laughs> I agree. Preferred nice. swimwear by the hosts. I, I assume you mean for like actual swimming, swimming <laughs> Ivy. Did you like, instead of just like lounging at the pool, one piece, I don't know. Yeah, for, is this <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah a one yeah. piece, I guess it's gotta be best for a try. Right. Yeah. I don't what know. Suit? Uh, what suit? Yeah. I, oh, for, for, for men, there's quite a few different choices. There's like jammers, which are basically like bike short length. And then there's like, uh, you can wear speedos or you can wear like the short, like boxer brief style ones, or you can, wear buoyancy shorts, which are basically just like wetsuit shorts, which are sweet. And they help with, uh, it's kind of like wearing like a pole boy, just nowhere near as effective as that. Um, there's a lot of different choices, but wetsuits, like if you can, yeah, it's a hundred percent. If you're in a pool, buoyancy shorts rock. I like them a lot. Sounds Keegan? good to me. I don't, yeah. even, I don't even know if I have, <laughs> swim, good, cool. I don't even good. have yeah. swim shorts here. So I don't yeah. go on, you know, <laughs> which host would win in an arm wrestling contest. Not me, not, not me. I. I have bad busted up elbows. And like, if I'm putting like force like that direction on things, oh, it gets real bad. Yeah, real bad. Okay, and he can be Ivy then. Maybe me then. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or can do money on Ivy. Yeah. I put money on Ivy. Yeah, I yeah. think I would put money on Ivy too. <laughs> <laughs> this would be good. Man. Yes. <laughs> we need to see it. Maybe leverage. I don't know. Mm-hmm. No, I don't know. Okay. Uh, next one. Does anything make all of you nervous about racing or are you experienced enough to not get nervous anymore? Hmm. I get excited. Yeah. And I think when I early on, when I was racing, I used to get really nervous. Um, my husband, David, again, he always has these little nuggets of wisdom. He used to be a ski racer and he raced slalom. So whenever I would get nervous before a bike race, he'd be like, why are you nervous? You literally have hours to figure it out. And that was a good point. Um, but I, I like, I like <laughs> on having, like, on like 32 <laughs> seconds of a slalom right. racer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I like the feeling. I like having a different feeling before a race than I do before a training ride. Like I like having that, that hype. Mm-hmm. Um, but as long as it's positive and it doesn't like tip over into feeling psyched out. Um, and I think I, I had a really good balance with that toward the end of my career. Mm-hmm. Amber or Ivy. Sorry. Uh, I think I used to confuse being nervous with just being excited. Um, yeah, I don't think nervous is the right way to describe how I feel or really ever felt about race. Like being nervous to me 
would yeah. be uh, like worrying about things that could go wrong or, or like what if statements. And I don't um, think that I do that uh, before mm-hmm. races. Um, get really excited and uh, anxious and high heart rate and stuff like that, but not nervous. Yeah. Keegan? Um, I'd say mostly, mostly excited. I'd say there's a rare occasions where I'm a little bit nervous. If it's something that 24 hours in the old Pueblo <laughs> solo. Yeah. yeah. Even then, like I'd say it's 90% excited, 10% nervous, just because I know there's like a small part of me that like, I just don't know what I'm doing. So, which is cool. Like I'm excited for that unknown, you know, or like when I'm Tobin done... in the background. <laughs> is it Tobin? Tobin? Actually, it's probably Griffin. Griffin gets excited sometimes. He's... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Griffin Easter, who I'm super excited to see how he does uh, this year in the lifetime Grand Prix races that he does. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Good guy. A fantastic guy. Everyone should go follow Griffin on social media, by the way. He had amazing, like amazing performances, then flat tires last year. It was super frustrating or like mechanicals. And I think he could have won a couple of really big races. And he also is a rider that is doing fantastic things with this foundation too, the Epicure foundation. He's just awesome. Go follow Griffin. He's really cool. Um, I don't get nervous. I get excited. My son uh, gets excited and he thinks that's nerves. So he, we always like stop and talk about that. We're like, is it nerves or is it excitement? And uh, he's naturally pretty tentative. So he leans toward the nervous side. I think that all of us probably have some filtering to do with that, like, and to try to understand it. So the one thing I will say though, is that, uh, I, I don't get nervous before races, but I do get nervous sometimes in the middle of races, like Tulsa tough in that crit because I nearly died like 10 times from riders, just like literally going left to right and just cleaning out my wheel and Mm. somehow staying up and like terrible decisions being made. I was 100% nervous in the middle of that race. Zero question. I'm with you there. That that makes me nervous too. (laughs) Oh gosh. It was so sketchy. Yeah. Oh, it was terrible. Um, okay. Going to fit in some more ones. Okay. If I can't fit in or fit all my training in what's better to skip threshold or sweet spot matters about your goals are like, Mm -hmm. if you're, if you're training for a 40 K TT, do not skip your threshold sessions. That is key. Um, if you're training for something that's like lower endurance or something else, then yeah, you can skip that threshold workout, but it's all about your goals. So it matters. Yeah. Also when you're using adaptive training, uh, you don't have to worry about which to skip. Like if you can't fit in your training on that day, don't complete your workout and adaptive training will make the change is necessary to make sure you don't have to wonder if it should be threshold or a sweet spot. It'll kind of rearrange those energy systems to make sure you do make up for that later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Or skip words. recovery day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. if Which... you're going to skip any day, recovery day is like almost an off day. Like it is great to yeah. do recovery days and there is a purpose for them. But if you're going to, if you have any day you have to throw out, that'd be the best, I would think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you skip uh, 10 key days a year, if you think about it, adding it up that way, like it actually does start to have an effect, right? So you just don't want to skip the high priority key days. So, and key, the best way to figure that out is, is it building toward the goals of your event? And that's, uh, or if you don't have an event, the goal that you have with training, you know, whatever it mm-hmm. might be. So, okay. Uh, next one, best pancakes from chain restaurants. Keegan, you're the authority on this one, Mr. Pancake guy. You can start there and then we'll wrap back around. Honestly, I have no idea. I don't really get pancakes when i go out to eat, eat breakfast honestly i normally get something that i don't make at home every day like some omelet or something so i i have no no authority here your pancakes <laughs> are good those sourdough pancakes were delicious by the way those are good right. yeah you know yeah do okay <laughs> i do okay i do okay Ivy. i try my best <laughs> i would never ever order pancakes from a restaurant <laughs> strong stance Ever. strong opinion, like, opinion held strong or like waffles you go to brunch and it's 12 dollars yeah. for a belgian waffle and i'm like what is it it's ridiculous I would never ever do that i really try not to order breakfast from restaurants mm. okay. although it's breakfast do, it's burrito though breakfast burrito yeah that's mm-hmm. my yeah. go-to yeah yeah Pancakes, amber like, do you have an opinion six. denny's ihop something like that i assume what they're asking for <laughs> I can't say chain restaurant, but I have a really fond memory of growing up on the swim team. Once in a while, we would get to swip, skip morning practice and go out to breakfast. And that was here in Reno where most places that are open that early are casinos. And there was a really awesome restaurant. And I, I'm not sure if it's still here anymore, but silver dollar restaurant had 
just awesome pancakes. And I don't know if it's just because they tasted better because it was we're doing we're eating pancakes instead of training. Um, that, place <laughs> was, that place rocked. <laughs> if you had, if you give me any food and say you can have this or swimming, it will be the tastiest thing I've ever had. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> understandable. Uh, beach vacation or ski break? Ski. I'd say beach as long as there's surfing involved, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't refuse either. Yeah, Keegan. Probably ski. Yeah, ski but times. Depends on the time of year, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you don't want to be at ski resorts because they're just so busy and yeah, crazy. that's true. Good point. But sometimes you also don't want to be at the beach. So, oh, ski yeah. break does. I'm not at a resort in my mind. I'm like touring okay. totally alone. Should I consume the calories <laughs> I burn beach. on? Uh, this is a good question. Should I consume the calories I burn on that particular day or average for the week? I am just going to say average for the week. I'm going to override everybody else's opinion on this one. I think it's a fantastic idea instead of trying to feel like every day you have to go to like zeros. Like, right. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's healthy. Like it's That's super so unhealthy. <laughs> no, no, no. Pete brought this up and I think it's a brilliant idea. And Pete, Pete should make the app like for this. He was like, instead of worrying about every day closing out and like I'm balanced, I'm at zero calories or I'm at 100 calories or whatever it might be like relax a little bit and like, look at this on a scale of week and, and, and quit obsessing over the details so much because here's where that gets really, that gets really difficult. Let's say that you have an easy day then you have a super big volume day, and then you have an easy day thereafter. You're going to be tempted to be like, I'm going to fuel a bunch on the day where I'm doing all the work. But before that, since it was an easy day, you're going to come and depleted. And then after that, when you should be recovering, which is one of the things I've learned from Keegan, like you don't just starve yourself on your days, like your easier days in the middle of a training block like that. Like if you starve yourself on those days, that just means you're going to go and depleted into the next days. So Avoid all this overthinking, relax about it, and don't worry about zeroing out every day. I oh, eat Jonathan, just eat when yeah. you're hungry. And when you have when you have a lot of training or a big week, then eat eat past when you're hungry. Just keep eating. Mm-hmm. And then when you have a recovery Pretty week, proactive. don't eat as much. Thank you. I think people overthink this way too much. It's pretty simple. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm just thinking about uh someone averaging out for a week, waiting until Sunday and being like, oh no, and just eating like <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not. trying to average it out and just eating so much food i'm 1800 behind here we go totally bogus yeah. yeah that's why i'm like no don't do that because i can imagine our athletes taking that and running with it and being like i ate 6,000 calories today because i had to <laughs> fix my week average super bowl sunday that's it yeah. cheese dip yeah queso <laughs> um okay next one are you doing any world cups this year keegan no uh, have you ever consumed alcohol on the bike and did it turn out surprisingly okay? <laughs> this one's for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Amber I mean... has like a guilty child face <laughs> going on right now. <laughs> uh, you guys don't have to answer this. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of... yeah. We're going to move on. Yes. I'll just mention yes. that yes. the team Cliff Bar Racing, they usually ride to the uh, Cliff Family Winery mid-camp, midday. And then they ride back. Uh, Nate's told that story on the podcast before, but um, so you can go back through the icon archives and try to find that one. Okay. Next one, favorite (laughs) pre-workout meal or snack. And then we're going to get into some listener questions. Somebody snuck that live, that rapid fire one in, by the way, I think Sean probably put that in there. Somebody probably asked it in the live chat. I was not prepared. Okay. Favorite uh, pre-workout meal or snack. Um. I like a variety. So I, I, but an easy one for me that I really like is just uh, plain toast with jam. Mm-hmm. I like, uh, a, like a cold veggie wrap with like hummus and like chippies oh. and a bunch of crunchy veggies. Like pre ride. Like we're yeah. not like, that sounds like horrible. With, like within like three minutes before, how yeah. does your stomach handle that? That's strong opinions. I, here. Know, I think I'm just like a garbage can. <laughs> I can, I don't know. I just really like so you it. can eat that like within 30 minutes before, and then your gut isn't messed up. Yeah. I am so impressed. Easy. That's impressive. I wish I had yeah. that sort of tolerance in, in my, my, my fussy little gut is like, if it's not just pure sugar, then it doesn't work. You, Mine's rice crispy treats. That's what I wouldn't use. believe what I eat during a ride then. <laughs> uh, yeah. Super Bowl Sunday road to Costco with my buddies and 
ate a bunch of glizzies, hot dogs in the middle of our ride. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Shout great. out to gas awesome. station food cyclist on that one. Yeah. yeah. Hot dogs are those those are okay. Mid ride. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I'm, bringing some, I'm bringing some out to El Pueblo. So but yeah, pre-ride pancakes <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or like rice, pasta, something easy. It's, it's, yeah. As long as it means assuming it's like a reasonable training ride, if it's just recovery, then I'll eat whatever pretty much. Yeah. Rice crispy treat for me. It's easy. Yeah. Nice. They're good. It's done. Yeah. Tasty. Is something wrong I'll... with me? Am I making <laughs> the wrong choices? No, I'm impressed, Ivy. I just most people, if they were to eat something that's fibrous like that, and that has, cause vegetables tend to have a lot of fiber mm -hmm. and like hummus too, and everything else like that, if they end up doing that. Then it slows digestion and it can cause like gut distress and cramps and all that stuff. So you're just, okay. basically you have superpowers <laughs> is what we're getting at. You have Garbage like powers. hummus ve veggie wrap superpowers. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Alex says maybe actually Ivy, cause you've raced short races these days. And that's like what you do. Maybe you're actually like an, that skill alone could make you like the 24 hour world champion, being able to mm. eat like anything that you want and just keep on going. Maybe yeah. you're actually like the 24 just, hour time trial world champion, Ivy. Oh my gosh. Next year. You just haven't fulfilled it yet. Low. Here we go. It's your destiny. You just got to <laughs> manifest it. <laughs> okay. Alex says, and these were out of rapid fire. He says, any tips on gaining confidence while riding in the middle of the field? I tend to gradually lose position if I'm in the fat portion of the Peloton. So he's talking about the, the larger blob. <clears throat> if I'm towards the front somewhere in the single file section, I'm fine until the pace slows anyhow and the field gets fat again. The slower the field is going, the more exaggerated this effect seems to be. I'm an okay bike handler. I've been doing all my indoor training on rollers since 2015. And when sketchy stuff happens, i.e. contact avoiding crashes, managing the guy on my right side that forgot about a right hand turn. Sounds like a very specific uh, scenario that he's dealt with, etc. <laughs> he says in the field, I've been fine. Nevertheless, I'm always either on the side of the Peloton near the front or tail gunning. I know it's costing me a fair bit of energy, both in less of a draft as well as cognitive load. Amber, what do you have to advise on this one? Cause this is really common, particularly in fields you're unfamiliar with or aggressive fields, right? Yeah. So to your point about when the field fattens up, um, a quick, you know, guideline to, to go by when you're in a, in a, uh, sorry, in a mass start race, when the field fattens up, that's because the pace is slowed. And when the pace slows, the field fattens up and it's when the pace picks up that it takes on more of an arrow shape or has more of a line in the front. When it gets lined out and the pace is picked up, that's a really bad time to try to move up and gain position. So when the field fattens up, that's when you do want to gain position. But what you're mentioning here is when the field fattens up, it's especially hard to maintain your position if you're in the middle of the field. And that makes sense because this is when there's a lot more crowding and there's less mm -hmm. space to move around. So think about this, like surfing the field, there's going to be, there are going to be pretty typical currents, if you will, of patterns of movement where the, the um, where riders are moving. So as you pointed out, it tends to be easier on the side of the field. Well, if that works well in terms of drafting, if you're on the lee side of the field and, and by that, I mean, on the side of the field that's protected from the wind, but everyone wants to be there. And so what ends up happening is you have people moving up the sides of the field, cause that's an easier place to move up. And then they don't want to be on the front. So then they kind of move in toward the middle as they get closer to the front of the field. And then as the next wave of people moving up the sides comes forward and moves into the middle, they push those people back. And then the next wave comes and pushes those people back. So you kind of have this churn effect where on either side of the field, you have a, like a rotating current. And if you know this pattern, <laughs> yes. then if you move up the side and you move toward the middle and you feel yourself getting pushed back, move, you know, slowly start to move out to the side again and try to move out to the side before you get pushed too far back in the middle. So that's a really typical pattern. It doesn't mean it's going to happen in every race, but if you start to look at the movement in the field as a current and you'll see different, if you're in a crit, you'll be able to see this happening lap after lap and you'll see, okay, people tend to move up on the outside on this corner. People tend to move up on the inside of this corner, take notes, learn. And as you figure out where the currents are, you can start to predict that and mm -hmm. move yourself in response so that you're not getting pushed back. So being a little bit predictive of where people are moving, what the dynamic is and surfing those currents as much as you can. Um, it can be a little bit intimidating because, you know, being packed in and not having a lot of space can start to feel a little overwhelming. 
if that's something that frustrates you or, or is, um, concerning for you, remember that your job is to protect your, your front bars and your front wheel. And that's it. So as long as those are in a safe position and you're responsible for you, you're good. So keeping yourself safe will actually keep other people safe too. So that can bring down your cognitive load a little bit. Just focus on where you're putting your front wheel and your handlebars. As long as those are in a safe place, then you're okay. And you don't want to make any sudden movements, obviously. Um, and two more tricks I'll say one is focus on the negative space. And what I mean by that is don't yes. stare at the riders, stare at the space between them. Watch what's happening in that negative space. Watch what's happening in the space between the riders. Is there space opening? Is there space closing? That's what you want to be focused on, not on the riders and the bikes themselves. That's the Lastly, number one tip in, in my opinion. <laughs> that is such a good tip and a good way to phrase it too, because you're worried about the riders. So you fixate on the riders. And then mm -hmm. as a result, you're missing all this space and this opportunity for you to actually be much more comfortable, more efficient, safer, everything else. It's just, it's hard to do because you're just focused on the source of danger, which you perceive to be the rider, but really mm -hmm. like there's a safe space. You're just missing it the whole time. Oh, it's such a good tip. Yeah. Good point, Amber. Yeah. And keeping in mind that there's these currents that are happening and there's constant movement within the field. If you get pushed back, don't despair. Don't just throw up your hands and say, Oh, I'm at the back of the field. I'll never get to the front again because just a couple of key moves might put you at the front again. It's not like you have to move out to the side and motor up the side of the field just to get to the front. So a good way of managing that is to focus on moving your handlebars in front of two sets of handlebars at a time. So look around you, identify that negative space. If you see a space open up that you can move safely, move your front wheel and handlebars ahead of somebody else's front wheel and handlebars, do that. And then try to do it again and try to do that two at a time. So, okay. My goal right now is to move past two sets of handlebars. Just do that. And then once you're there, move past two more sets of handlebars. And what that'll do is it'll keep you from feeling overwhelmed by, Oh, I just got shuffled all the way back to the pellet, you know, at the back of the peloton. If you're thinking that you are definitely going to, you're going to continue to lose position, um, and not gain any more position. But if you just focus on two at a time, two at a time, two at a time, focus on moving into space safely, moving into space safely. Um, that will keep, sorry, I keep hitting my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, producer Maxine. Um, that will, that will keep your focus in a positive place. And mm -hmm. you might find that you only have to move past three handlebars and suddenly you'll find yourself at the front of the field again, because of how that current is moving. So if you feel yourself overwhelmed by the whole concept, break it down into something really, really simple that will keep your focus and keep you in a positive mental space. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Fantastic points. Uh, Ivy, you have an alternative way to do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Amber just described perfectly how to move around in a field and, uh, yeah, absolutely nailed it. But Alex's core question, how to gain confidence in the middle of the field uh, my answer is don't, don't gain confidence <laughs> being in the middle of a field because nothing good that will happen in the race will happen from the middle of the field. That's not a place that you want to be. And I mm. know that they're addressing that there's a cognitive load. There's a tax to having to think about how you're moving around all the time, but that doesn't go away. Even at the highest level of the sport, there's no time in the race where you just get like, unless there's a break mm -hmm. up the road and your GC riders up there and you just get to like chill out and whatever, there's no time in which you get to just be blissed out and just surf around and no think you have to always be thinking and moving. Um, so don't get confident in the middle of the field. Don't be there. You don't want to be there. Nothing happens. From mm -hmm. there. Keegan, is there anything the you've only... learned? Oh, sorry. Go, Go ahead. Amber. I was going to say the only benefit to being in the middle of the field is a it's a good process goal to learn how to get comfortable in case you get shuffled there on accident. And B, sure. if there is a genuine long stretch of a race where you don't have to be on duty or paying attention to what's happening in the race. So for example, mm -hmm. there would be times when I would be on a team where my job would be to conserve energy because my upcoming difficult job is going to be several kilometers up the road. And I really want to take advantage of as much draft as possible. That's where I might park it in the middle of the field and really try to conserve energy. Um, but I think Ivy's point is a really, really good one for most people. This is not necessarily a place that you want to be. So you want to practice the skill because you want to feel confident in your ability to move around in a group. 
but apply this judiciously only fight for position when it really, really matters. Cause it does take energy. Even if you're not pedaling hard, it is taking cognitive load and that will sap you. And you want to make sure that you're mm-hmm. super, super sharp at the point in the race when it really matters to make a selection and get yourself into that position. So practice it as a skill. Um, but then remember when it's really important, you want to be applying this very judiciously. Mm. Keegan, what, what have you learned uh, going from like, boy, like cross country Olympic is totally different in Mm -hmm. from this gravel thing. Um, but you have plenty of experience riding in groups too. What would you say to, in this case, to Alex? I mean, Amber had all sorts of good points. I think the simplest thing that kind of helps me that's helped me navigate packs and groups and stuff is like, if you're not going forward, then you're going backwards. And it's like pretty simple. Like if there's a hole in front of you, if you don't fill it, someone else is going to fill it and you're going to slowly get like shuffled back. So I think it's just a constant, like, like a constant, like Amber said, it's a constant flow. And I think you'd just be looking for holes. Like, like she mentioned, like the negative space, if there's a hole there, put your wheel there and try and get your bars there before someone else does. Otherwise you're going to get shuffled back. And after a while, it just, it kind of becomes habit. Um, and then I was also fine. Like, you don't have to always be in the middle. You can just chill at the back. And then if you want to get to the front, wait for like a nice big turn and you can just swing outside and carry speed and then float, like, like kind of like filter your way back in. So I think, you don't have to always be fighting for the front. Sometimes it's fine to be in the back. And sometimes if you want to fight for the front, it's easier. Once you get up there, it's easier to hold position. You can just like, you know, bump people off or like keep filling holes. And like, eventually you'll kind of learn it just like a learning experience. Really. I think group rides are a good place to practice that too. Um, I would love to, I would love to talk about this for like three hours because we totally could. Um, there's so a lot of theoretical scenarios. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is. Um, we're already over the two hour mark, but according to the survey, people uh, don't complain about it being long. Um, they, they like it being long because you can just digest it in chunks. So, um, but the one thing where this gets really tricky is when you have a course that is bending left or right, left, right, left, right, and going back and forth like a crit course where there is a favorable line and people are fighting for that line. And when I say a favorable line, I mean like there's manhole covers, there's something else. And you can watch that race from Tulsa tough for a great example of this. We have it on our YouTube channel. You can go and see, I crash at the end of the race, um, but you'll get to see a lot of chaos and you can even see the full race to see that. I was absolutely like f- just going around the rim because the center was just so chaotic. Um, it wasn't people like finding holes as much as it was problems happening. And then like crazy ripple effect. So if you were in the middle, you just constantly didn't float to the back. You got thrown to the back or you crashed. That was like your choice. And then you'd have to like work your way back up. So, you know, you can try to find space, like Keegan said, to try to like get yourself to move around. But honestly, the best thing for you, Alex, in this case is quit, quit focusing so much on being in the group and instead focus on what you want to accomplish in the race. And if you do that, you'll find yourself in the right spot. Like, if, if your goal with that race is to upset the race and to make it surgy and attack and try to draw people out and make them make bad decisions and attack when they shouldn't, then this is a situation where your position will be totally just a, a, an afterthought or a result of how you are fulfilling your goals in the race. If your goal with the race is to sit in and sprint, then your position is going to be a result of that. Like um, the, a lot of the time we get so focused on the basics that we forget about what we're actually accomplishing in the race. And you're a good bike rider, Alex. You said that you've got good bike handling skills. You've got everything else. I'd say focusing on the negative space is one thing, actionable thing that can really help. And like Keegan and Amber both said, you know, find those spots and move forward two at a time, something like that. But really, if you just stay focused on your goal, your position's going to work out. And if you have the fitness to back up such a goal. So I know that sounds kind of weird, but I think that if we do shift our perspective, then it ends up being better. As soon as we start focusing too much on fighting for one position and staying static in a spot in the field, Mm -hmm. that's when we make bad decisions. People will not want to ride behind you and they'll fill in right in front of you and make it even tougher. You won't be riding fluidly. You won't be making good decisions. So it's it's dynamic. It's gotta be, Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, I'm going to skip over this next question that we have and just go into Christina's, but I want to mention something base. Actually, I'm going to read this one. We're going to do it. You guys. Okay. On time. It's okay. If we do this. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Brock's question. Enormous burrito as soon as we're done, but I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Brock says AI FTP detection is dope. And he says dope in all caps, which is pretty (laughs) sweet. 
Uh, for the past two weeks, my level seven plus sweet spot workouts have started feeling moderate. And I figured I'd have about a 15 watt increase from my old FTP of 264. And sure enough, it recommended 281 watts. Uh, adaptive training reset my levels and the level four sweet spot workout felt perfect. This whole thing is just so seamless now. It's better than any training I've had, even with coaches. Thank you, Amber and team. That is awesome, Brock. Thank you. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, he says, I do have a question though. I'm still in the base phase, but doing a lot of sweet spot work, which is enough to, th or which is close enough to threshold that it makes sense. The AI FTP detection could get a good idea of what my FTP is in the build phase. However, I'm going to try one of the experimental polarized plans that you have and looking at the training, I'll either be in the endurance zone or doing threshold or VO2 workouts. If my threshold levels aren't high enough to be doing long threshold repeats, will adaptive training or AI FTP detection, forgive me, still be able to get an accurate fix on my FTP from just VO2 and endurance training. Uh, this one's for Amber. Amber, take it away. Yes. Yes. Period. <laughs> you don't need max efforts um, and they no. don't have to be threshold efforts, right? Right. So that's, that's actually one of the really cool things about this model. And this is what makes this model so much different than what we see on other platforms. So, um, most most other methods of determining FTP from your data will look at a max effort or an effort that exceeded a previous FTP. And then it will use um, a static equation to calculate out what they think your FTP is based on that effort. Our model is very different. It doesn't require capacitive efforts or max efforts. What we do is we actually look at your training holistically in order to determine what your FTP is. So because we're using a lot more data, um, we can actually hone in on what your FTP is, even if you're not doing threshold efforts, even if you're not doing max or capacitive efforts. So that is one of the really cool differentiators about this model. And so far it's working really well. We've had a couple of edge cases, um, but you know, the more people that can sign up for this and start using it, the, the better it's going to become. Yep. And you can even do this without even riding inside or doing trainer road workouts at all, really like, uh, yep. If you just do your outside riding, it's still going to be analyzing that outside riding as well, which is super cool. Exactly. So not just outside workouts, it actually will look at all of your unstructured riding as well. So you get credit for everything and that's how, um, and so we'll, we'll look at all of that data to determine what your FTP likely is. Pretty sweet. So you could just be doing like endurance stuff, tempo stuff, whatever else, and we'll mm -hmm. figure it out from there. It's pretty awesome. Yep. Uh, no stress. Okay. Last question from Christina. She says, Hey, trainer roadies. I guess that's our name. I didn't know. Okay. Trainer roadies. That's us. I like it. <clears throat> she says, I'm so happy. I found this podcast community. I'm a recovering triathlete. And she says, don't go to the dark side, Jonathan, turn back. It's not too late. <laughs> uh, she says, uh, who's found cy uh, cyclocross and crit racing in the past three years. It is so much fun. And I wish I would have found it years ago. I'm writing to ask what feels like an ungrateful question. I just finished the base phases of trainer road and I saw 14% power to weight ratio improvement way to go. Wow. She says it's my first year training with trainer road and any real structure at all, I guess. And while it has been really hard, I'm blown away at how much I've improved over 12 weeks, but this is where I start to feel ungrateful. I'm worried about this improvement. I feel like it's too much too soon and that now I won't get faster in the build phase. That seems problematic to me since the name and even the description of the build phase makes me feel like that being the build phase is where I should see most of my improvement. Have I, and she says in quotes, gone out too hard in a sense, I use it after training. So other than the first workout or two, I never rated a sweet spot workout harder than quotes hard or moderate. So I feel like I didn't bite off more than I can chew in the training. I guess I'm just worried all plateau and risk overtraining after such a strong base phase. Am I wrong? Can you call my overly analytical brain, please? <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> Uh, this is actually pretty common, right? Uh, we see this with a lot of athletes. So think about coming into the base phase and Keegan, you even see this, like you see a lot of improvement in the base phase every year from the beginning of base to the end, right? That's mm -hmm. normal for you. Yeah. So, because you're coming off of usually time off. So you've had to detrain, uh, you've had time to detrain and become less fit and then, or you are getting into training from the beginning and you have a lot of room to grow and a ton of potential. And you're going to see really fast gains. So it is really common to see improvement in the base phase. The, the goal of the base phase isn't to raise FTP. It's to make you aerobically fit. And that then as a result of that, your FTP does go up. That is very common, especially if you've experienced detraining or a lack of training before that. So that's, that's pretty common there. Um, 
However, I kind of want to talk about like setting expectations for this because uh, there is a lot of fear. We get people saying like, well, now I'm, am I going to get anything in the base phase? Or even people that say, I got all my improvement in the base phase and now I didn't get anything in the build phase. Uh, so did the build phase not work? And I want to talk about that assumption right there is that if indeed you don't see as much improvement later on as you did in the base phase, did those phases not work? What would you say to that, Amber? Um, it's all money in the bank <laughs> is really what it comes down to. And one thing that they mentioned is um, they're new to structured training. And so that's already off the bat. You're going to see huge early gains just by getting into structured training coming from unstructured training. So that is not surprising at all. Um, and I wouldn't worry, just go find out. I mean, this is, this is the beauty of the training. It's a giant, never ending self-experiment. You get to learn about yourself, um, year over year, it's going to change year to year. Everybody's different too. So some people are going to respond differently to different types of training. That's something else that you get to learn about yourself. And who knows, maybe you'll see even bigger gains in the build phase. I mean, you have so much to discover here. I don't see any reason to be afraid of that. Just go see mm -hmm. what you can see. You've already, you've already had this huge improvement. I mean, <clears throat> there's nothing to lose here. <laughs> like just mm -hmm. go see if you can make more gains. Yes. Ivy, do you see a lot of athletes, I'm sure, talk about this on the forum, whether it's musing about the possibility or actually experiencing it. What what would what advice would you have? Uh don't stress, ride this high. Um yeah. yeah. You know, make hay. <laughs> watts per kilogram too, especially since this is their first, you know, structured training. It's a base phase, probably coming off of an off season. There's a good chance that they maybe have lost some weight during mm -hmm. this base phase. And that could be, you know, where you see such a big improvement in Watts per kilogram and that's going to slow down and it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, just ride this high. It's all right. The reason the, the plans are there for a reason, uh, to progress you and move you in a way that makes sense for your goals and that those jumps in improvement won't always make sense to us as athletes, but it's part of the plan. Just trust the process. Yeah, the, the FTP is just one way to measure improvement. And then with trainer row, we have progression levels. Then you can see your abilities improve in other more relevant ways to whatever your goals are. Right. But like Keegan, like there's, there's more to it, right? Like in the build phase yeah. and the specialty phase, you're building other skills than just raising FTP. Well, and your FTP also, like just cause let's say you test an FTP of 300 Watts doesn't mean that you can actually go do 300 watts for an hour and maybe during the build phase you can actually like your ftp might not increase but you might have a more usable ftp like oh now i can actually do 300 watts for an hour or whatever it may be which is a lot more useful than having an ftp of 320 but not actually being able to do that so i think just because you don't see an ftp increase doesn't mean you're not going to get faster like maybe you can now maybe you can now do like three 20 minute intervals at ftp instead of only being able to do one or two so you're going to see improvements, but they might not be like direct improvements on your Watts per kilo or your actual FTP, but you're faster and you can do that FTP longer. Or there's so there's like so much more that goes into it than just numbers. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the sort of thing that shows up in progression levels too, right? Like when right, you can now do you. three by 20 instead of one by 20, you're going to mm -hmm. go up from like a level four threshold up to like a level seven by that time, you know, mm -hmm. you'll have worked your way up. That's like, uh, it's, it's a really tough thing for, for us to wrap our minds around that if our FTP isn't improving, that we aren't improving, but that's totally not the case. There's so many that your repeatability increases your ability to be able to, like you said, time, it, uh, time to exhaustion at whatever effort you're putting out will extend mm -hmm. so many different things. So, um, so Christina, you may not see a big bump in Watt KG in FTP, anything else, but like Amber said, it's all money in the bank. If you're following a well, properly structured plan, which you're following adaptive training. So of course it is. And in that case, you're just going to be getting faster and faster. Remember the goal isn't an FTP race. If that was the goal and don't get me wrong, everything is better on a bike with a higher FTP other than eating. You probably burn. Mm. If you're like Felipe Ogana, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he keeps up with his burn rate with like a 500 and whatever watt threshold he has. Um, but everything is better with a higher FTP, right? Like, wouldn't it be great to make it so that when somebody rides at 400 Watts, it's like, yeah, okay, well, that's still sweet spot for me. That's not too bad. But that said, 
it's not everything. And if it was just an FTP contest, they'd show up at the line, they'd show their numbers and then it'd be done. There's so much more to racing and there's so much more to riding and doing, taking on big, like what a solo goal, whatever you have, if it's not a race or just accomplishing something, there's way more to riding bikes than just having a high FTP. And that's what training's about. It's just preparing you to be a good bike rider, not just be a big number. So, uh, yeah, follow the training. You're going to get faster. That's the whole goal, Christina. It's exciting stuff. Uh, y'all, we, we went long on this one, 220. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, I appreciate having you. Keegan, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where can people get in touch with you? Uh, Instagram is the best place. Uh, just Kegels99. And I try and get back to most people. I'm sorry if I don't get back to you right away. So I'm, just, I'm bad with things, technology. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I try my best. <laughs> And uh, you can, if you're at 24 hours in the old Pueblo, you can go cheer him on there. He's going to need it. Yeah, uh, come say hi. There. I'll be spinning laps. So That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, with that, everybody, we'll talk to you next week. Share this podcast with your friends. Like, rate, share the whole thing on the app, on this podcast, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Guys.